Raw number 280, October 5th, 1998. X-Pac versus D'Lo Brown. D'Lo is spelled with an apostrophe this week. So I can only imagine D'Lo turned to the white production assistant and said, my name is D'Lo, and the white guy said D apostrophe Lo. What does being white have to do with anything? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my stereotypes are incorrect. Maybe someone pushed the wrong button on the title maker. That could be too. It just looked weird. So they're out there wrestling. China gets served papers at ringside. Mark Henry's on the other side of the ring. He laughs and says, that's for me. And she tore the papers up. Uh, Dilo Mr. Frog Splash. X-Pac made his comeback. Crowd loved the Bronco Buster. Totally into X-Pac here. Henry slammed X-Pac into the post. Dilo followed up with the sp- Frog Splash to win the match. Regain the coveted European title. It totally fucked up the finish of this match. I did or they did? You did. Okay. So, X-Pac is hitting the ropes and Mark Henry trips him and he falls down. So X-Pac decides, this fucker tripped me. I'm going to take him out with a springboard high cross or a pescado. Of course, it's a bad idea. Henry is 450 pounds or something like that. The world's strongest man, I've heard. Catches X-Pac, then he posts him and then D-Lo hits the low down for the pin. So, X-Pac had Filthy Tom Lawler and I been doing Geek of the Week 19 years ago this week. Probably would have been X-Pac. Because he fucked it all up for himself. He was an idiot. And he lost. Thus losing, by the way, the prestigious WWE European Championship. It's funny. It went for months and months and months. And nobody even knew who the European Champion was. And here in the last three weeks, it's changed hands three times? Yeah, they're fighting for it now. Unlike back in the old days. Well, it kind of makes it feel almost important. Usually you would hate something like this. Well, it's important until the third time and you realize it's just a toy. It was important when X-Pac beat D-Lo. Now, it's just dumb. So trying to hit the ring, but she froze, and D-Lo and Henry just taunted her and left. By the way, how is D-Lo Brown almost 300 pounds? Doesn't look that big, does he? He's Craig size? He's bigger than you, Vinny? That's what they claim. Remember the one time we were backstage at a TNA event, and D-Lo had put on, like, 55 pounds. So he was 400 pounds then? No, I'm thinking he was 300 then. Okay, so he's probably closer to 250. I think at one point he actually was 300, but then lost like 70. Yeah, he lost yeah, a yeah. lot of weight. <laughs> and they, they forgot about the weight loss. But he's out here with skinny X-Pac. Yes. And they're, they're talking about him like he's the size of Vader. Yes. <laughs> like, he ain't that big. He's a, he's a little he's a little chunky. He was 240 or so. He probably looked about 240. Yeah. Oh, I'm all about I'm all about accuracy here. There's no lies in wrestling. I don't like these people telling me fake weights. No. What do you think this is? He said Vince McMahon had been readmitted to an undisclosed medical center. Readmitted, so he was out. Well, they explained this later in the show because apparently he had been to one on heat too. Right. But Vince that was the night before. Yeah, but he kept getting checked into hospitals. But he's Vince McMahon, so he would check himself out, only to get readmitted the next day. Hold on a second. Not yeah. to mention they were in so another city the week before. Who's readmitting him? They said his doctors. But I imagine Vince says, I'm Vincent Mann, damn it. I don't need to be in this hospital. He would check himself out, and like an hour later, his foot would hurt. He had to go back. Okay. This storyline's stupid. I like the, I like it better that he hurt his ankle, and he's been in the hospital for a week. Hooked up to tubes... And getting his blood pressure taken regularly. The only flaw in that is they were in a different city last week when he got attacked. Well, you know, he's this is why being they, flown around. This is why they had to explain he's being leaving the centers and being readmitted every no, day. No, right. Vinny, here's a problem. Do you know how many times we've seen the gimmick where every single week, like, somebody is in their office that's, like, built right there, and they pretend like... They pretend like th- their office doesn't move, but like they go to a different city every week. Okay. You know what I mean? Sure. They didn't need to explain this. Like, sometimes you need to explain something, but them explaining this is even more ridiculous than just pretending like, you know, he's in the hospital. I just figured they Steve put Austin his, is nearby. I just figured they put an office in every arena that they went to. Not to mention, the hospital didn't need to be in the city that Raw was in. Well, it Because did. Steve Austin was not at Raw. But, Brian, they promised throughout Steve Austin will be here tonight. They thought Steve Austin would be in their town. But he wasn't. Right. But so, they So the point is the hospital could have been where Raw was last week. But then they would have known Austin wouldn't be there. No, like, he, he We could... haven't seen Steve Austin all day. We don't know where he is That's as opposed right. to Steve Austin was here this afternoon putting his boots on. He'll be here tonight. Why'd they have to say that? 
They didn't. They, exactly. Brian, how could they have known he was going to be there, which he wasn't? How could they have believed he was going to be there if he had not been in the building all day? Are they that dumb? Well, you send Steve Austin his ticket to the next city, and you expect him to get on the airplane. So That's how. when Raw goes on the air, and the biggest star in the world... It happens all the time. Is not there. Yeah. And they show up late. On every show we see this. Right? Why are we arguing about this? Well, that's a good question. It doesn't matter. Headbangers came out and challenged clowns. <laughs> not even the clowns, just clowns. All of them, everywhere. Mosh got a terrible promo. Thrasher was slightly better. The oddities came out, but the headbangers said, no, 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 we want the clowns. So the insane clown posse appears. So who are the baby faces? who are the heels? Well, Head headbangers are heels, head for sure. heels are heels, yeah. okay. So ICP comes out, and there's a lot of stalling, and finally they agree, oddities, you go to the back, we will go fight the headbangers. No fear! So we had the headbangers versus the insane clown posse. Complete squash start to finish. Headbangers just whipped their ass. Both clowns took chair shots to the head, and then the headbangers won with their fucked up finish. They did? There was a match? I guess it was just a fight. It was just a fight. Regardless, yeah. they fucked up their finish. There wasn't a match. As always. I was actually disappointed because I think if they had actually done a tag team wrestling match, I bet you ICP would have been better. Of course they would have. Hmm. Yeah. They would have been better than the Headbangers. Yes. That's bold. No, it's not. I know. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> headbangers sucked, and the clowns were At least workers. had charisma. <laughs> yeah. So that was it. They showed Steve Austin the night before using an axe to cut the cable broadcasting the signal from Vince's hospital to the production truck. He's so mad at Vince that he doesn't want Vince even watching Heat. Well, he doesn't want to hear Vince, He doesn't want to have Heat to be a platform for Vince. <laughs> Which, by the way, I, I hate to get into this again, but oh, here we go. let me get this straight. He cut a cable that was broadcasting Heat to Vince's hospital bed? No, that was broadcasting Vince's signal to Heat. I see. He didn't want Vince okay, to speak. Okay, I got it. Now I got it. Wow, you're dumb. Well, I was confused there. <laughs> you actually thought... There was one cable? No, that's the way you explained it. <laughs> Did you want... Okay. One guy trips and all the cable goes out. <laughs> Listen, I, no, saw, I, like I saw Steve Austin with an axe. He's chopping shit up. It's like, stuff from heat. I like Who the cares? idea better. There's a cable from a truck in like Cleveland to Vince's hospital in Christ knows where. And this that's one cable... That's why I was asking. This, this like, I was yes. asking if he cut that cable, why could we keep watching? We still eat? use the same technology. When you order the network, one guy will drive a truck from Vince Man's house. Let me tell you something about wrestling. If the storyline would have been that Steve Austin cut the cord that broadcast Heat on the USA Network, and the last 10 minutes of Heat was just static, it would have done a great number. It may have been. I guarantee it. It would have done a great number. That's what they should have done. They had an ad for Stone Cold Metal. Steve Austin's favorite heavy metal songs, including tracks by Dawkins and Rainbow. Hmm. They recapped the attack on Vince last week. Austin, the Zamboni, Austin beating him up, and then Taker and Kane destroying Vince. Here's where they explained Vince kept checking himself out of hospitals too early and having to go back the next day, which is why he was at a different hospital every show. So we go to the hospital he's in at he's at now. The nurse is Dumb. checking on him and getting him juice. It's the wrong kind of juice, and he's being a dick to everybody. And uh, he's got a heart rate monitor on, so you hear the beep, beep, beep. Then the nurse says, You have a visitor. Vince looks up and says, I don't want visitors, just my family. She says, no, no, you have a visitor. It's a really big guy. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> it is, of course, Mankind. Mankind has balloons for Vince. Wants to turn his frown upside down. It's got chocolate. It's got chocolate. to be melted. Well, wasn't he? <laughs> Foley talked about this in his book. It's like ad lib start to finish. He gives Vince the chocolates. And Vince opens them. I think like three of the five are eaten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But Vince never had a chance to explain this to the viewer at home. I oh, don't want that coconut one. I guess not. So then Mankind brings in some female entertainment. Vince is the best eye roll. And the female entertainment is Yurple the Clown. She was so great. She was great. <laughs> she was so great. Vince was great. Mankind is great. She didn't care that this was <laughs> no. Vince McMahon. No. <laughs> multi-millionaire owner of the World Wrestling Federation. To her, he was just another sick kid at the hospital. That's right. 
before she came in, Mankind says, she does a trick with a dog you won't believe. Yeah. I got the eye roll. <laughs> so she does her dog trick, which is she ties a balloon into a dog shape. I couldn't believe it. And <laughs> she is doing this trick. Well, he was right. Mankind takes, I had to look this up to make sure I get the right terminology. This is a siren whistle. That's what they're called. He blows a siren whistle right in Vince's face. Vince's mm -hmm. bug-eyed expression is out into space. The best. I always wanted one of those kids with the gauged earrings to put those in his ears and ride a bike really fast. <laughs> That'll also work. Yeah. I was dying at this. Uh, Mankind said, I have another special guest for you, and we got the worldwide debut of Mr. Socko. Vince is frustrated. First, he tries his best to ask them nicely to leave. Then he orders them to leave. Then he starts screaming at them to leave. And finally, they do. Damn it, leave! <laughs> Vince just throws his head back in disgust. Mr. Socko. This is the second best Vince McMahon performance of all time, and the second best Vince McMahon performance on the show. Sable came out to do commentary. In my favorite outfit. For the record. That's fair. Describe for the people at home. It's all latex with nothing underneath. Fair enough. What the fuck do you want me to say? Did you not see it? Where were you? Well, I was taking notes. I was doing my job. So I was, was I. I was being a I bet you were. So. Yes, I was taking notes. One of the women yes. sitting uh, behind the, the announce desk was Tori, who is now much like the hospital at every city they do. <laughs> uh, the announcers never acknowledge her, but she could not contain her joy when Sable high-fived her. Vader versus Mark Merrow. All just a setup for Sable and Jacqueline for the women's title. The double team invader right in the front of the ref is not a DQ. Kraus starts changing Sable's name. Jacqueline interferes again. Excuse me, would you repeat what happened right in front of the referee? Uh, there was a double team. A uh, double team right two, in front of the referee? Two people beat a Vader, one of whom was not a legal combatant in the match. Okay, just checking. And, right? and let me. And, uh, once again, that was not a DQ, you said? There was no disqualification. Okay, just no. checking. Yeah, she raked his eyes at one point. Yeah. In front of the ref. Yeah. Huh, how about that? Just so, just checking. So she tried to interfere a second time, tried to dive off the top rope on him, and overshot her target. She overshot Vader. <laughs> That's amazing. He was very strong and caught her and saved her life, and they got through it, and Mero had a low blow and a shooting star press for the win. Jacqueline calls out Sable. Sable hits the ring, but Mero cuts her off and says, you can never satisfy me. She slaps him. Jacqueline lays her out from behind, pulls out a pair of scissors, and cuts off a lock of hair. What the lock of hair? She cut off a whole chunk of hair. It was an extension. Let's be honest. No way. Come on. Craig, wrestling is real. Okay. It's a big-ass chunk of hair. Stephen Regal was out in the woods being a real man's man. By squeezing his own orange juice? Squeezing. I'll tell you what was manly about this. Squeezing his own oranges with his bare hands to get his juice, and then drinking it, as the announcer claimed, pulp and all. That's disgusting. Was he in the woods in Florida? Apparently. I guess. Yeah, he could be in the woods anywhere. With oranges? Could be, he didn't he, have to pick the oranges. He goes to the store, he gets the oranges, take them into the woods, make yeah. juice. A real man would pick the oranges. Well, maybe there weren't oranges in the damn forest, so he brought some from the store. Hmm. Edge versus Owen Hart was a scheduled match. This was the saddest thing I ever saw until <laughs> Owen actually died. Th this, well, both shows, there's... Dude. There's reason watching these in hindsight Owen sucks. comes out... Because Owen had dropped Severn on his head, supposedly, mm -hmm. and supposedly broke the guy's neck. Which, by the way, like, Vince is in the hospital with a broken ankle, Severn's paralyzed, and we don't hear a word about his... Well, he didn't have anything to say anyway. So, Owen says, I've been in this business 13 years, it's been my whole life. After last week, what I did with Dan Severn, I looked in his eyes, I saw my own wife and two children. I never meant to hurt anybody. I'm sorry for what I did, and he leaves. Yeah. Comes back, of course, as the blue blazer. Eventually, they string him up above the arena, and he falls and dies. And this was like the beginning of that. Yeah. This promo. Every time we see Owen now for the next nine months is going to be very sad. But this was so depressing, like this this promo that he cut right here. Mm -hmm. It was so depressing. I wanted to just stop watching wrestling forever. Wasn't oh. Owen hurt at this time as well? He had a minor injury, but nothing serious. He was just getting ready to come back as the Blue Blazer. Yeah. Uh, the other wrestling note here is that it was going to be Owen Hart versus Edge. And as Edge makes his entrance, the announcers just randomly, casually announce, Oh, by the way, Edge and Christian are brothers now. Maybe that was revealed on Heat. 
Before Probably. Steve Austin chopped that cable and may have been ended the show. May have been. Yeah, this was depressing. It put me into a funk. Then Michael Cole tried to interview Owen after the break. Owen wouldn't even look back at the camera. He said it was over, he was done, and he walked out of the building. Yeah. Ken Shamrock versus Kane. I thought they did a great job of making this the story of a monster versus a very technically trained, skilled fighter. Well, maybe you could answer the question of why Ken Shamrock's a babyface this week. <laughs> no. Because he was a heel last week. <laughs> he was a heel in Detroit he last week. he came out here and he worked as a baby face. Were he in and, San Jose or wherever his hometown is? I don't think so. Hmm. I don't know what was going on here. This match was Ken Shamrock bouncing off the ropes, hitting Kane with something, Kane no-selling it, and Shamrock picking himself off the mat. There was a lot of that. There was a lot, a lot of, of it. Undertaker came out after a while. So Kane went up top, but Taker gets in the apron... And whether this was intentional or not was unclear, but he the ropes got shook and Kane got crotched. And Shamrock hit an avalanche belly to belly for the pinfall win. And Kane was outraged and stormed to the back. God damn, we're getting into it's already starting. Like Kane and Undertaker are both on their way to championship matches, and so they've got to lose a bunch of matches leading to it. That too. What the fuck happened? When did the the switch just flipped? It's like the first time they've been doing this. In all the time we've been watching Raw, challengers getting beaten en route to championship matches. Yeah. That and we spent a whole we spent all summer trying to figure out if Kane and Taker were in cahoots. They were, and like two weeks later they're now breaking up. Well, you see, now they're both having to oppose each other for the title. But yes, it's unbelievable. I invested months into that storyline. No, he really didn't. I mean, we were supposed to, <laughs> but we did not invest any time in that stupid storyline. It sucks. It still sucks. Val Venus found Terry's wedding ring in her vagina. That's what That's what happened. Yeah. Val Venus versus Gangrel. It's not a good place to keep it, by the way. I would bet not. Yeah. You know that Christian was only 25 here and he looked 10 years older? Easy. Yeah. He's another guy. He's always looked about 40. Maybe older. Had some sweet flow, though. I just like they were in Michigan, at, uh, Michigan State's campus, so Val finally got to cut a promo about his Magic Johnson. That was funny. That would indicate that they were not in Ken Shamrock's hometown. That's true. Lodi, California. You got me there. He had no stage, so Gangrel didn't get his Ring of Fire entrance. He just knelt down, and there was some smoke, and he stood up. Is it me, or is there a totally random point in the floor, where, or in the match, where they cut to the floor... And Terry just turns her back to the camera and flashes the crowd. I don't know if she flashed him, but she did something that they popped for. He went crazy. Yeah, I don't think she flashed the fans. I think that would be a no-no. Mm. But I think she was trying Not to elicit... Not if you're Jackie. That's true. I think she was trying to elicit some... Something from the crowd. <laughs> well, it's just, she elicited it. Yeah. It was elicit. JR was having an impossible time keeping the names of Gangrel, Edge, and Christian straight. Had a fun two-minute match. Edge comes out to confront Christian... Gangrel jumps Edge from behind, hits a DDT on the floor. Excuse me. Hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me that Gangrel attacked a guy who wasn't in the match mm -hmm. and it was a DQ? I yes. said count out? It was a disqualification. All right. This was so stupid. Yes, the rules change every match and you have to guess what's going on. Literally, they changed three times at least on this show. Because I can think of one other instance coming up where the rules are just completely random. It's And for all of you fuckers who always go, it's not a DQ until the guy who runs in touches somebody. Well, here's your example of it is a DQ apparently when someone gets involved... This guy didn't even get in the ring. No, he was a victim. He was a victim. Gangrel went after him. This idiot ran in, and Gangrel just slid out of the ring and beat his ass. Yes. And got DQ'd for it. Yeah. So, Gangrel and Christopher, as Ross called him, put the boots to him. <laughs> so, Val wins. He's done. He's done. And then he and Terry decided, hey, I got a free time. Let's have sex. Goldust's old movie usher appears. Hey, at least it's in character. Absolutely. Uh, he presents Val with a golden envelope. Val reads what's inside and seems upset. Goldust's music starts, and then his voice is heard announcing a world premiere for next week. Listen, all you're bitching about that Kahoot storyline, all that time with Dustin as a born-again Christian led to jack shit. I think it was about five weeks. 
But that still. was five weeks too many. Two minutes at a time. Dude. Uh, from Heat, Austin came out to the announce desk to harass Shane McMahon. Shane said, your issue is with my father, not me. And then Austin, I guess, believed him because he went into the ring and beat up Jeff Jarrett in Southern Justice and had a stare down with The Rock. Back at the hospital, Vince is displeased with his nurse. Vince wants pain pills. He wants pain pills and a new nurse. Yeah, that's fair. Art imitating life. Al Snow versus Jeff Jarrett. This was not fair. I, too, demand pain pills. <laughs> Can we talk about the most awesome spot they did? Al, Al's beating him up, and he sends him outside, and Al starts looking around, and finally he finds a steel chair. And he grabs the chair, and he starts heading towards Jeff Jarrett, and Jeff Jarrett punches him in the face. <laughs> that, that happened. Gets the heat. I was like, you idiots came up with that spot. <laughs> That's what they did. So I'm going to get a chair, and then you just hit me. I'll fall down. Okay. <laughs> cool. That's what happened. That is exactly He's what a, happened. You're exactly I'm not right. exaggerating no. one bit. That was the spot. So Al grabs head and goes up top, but Sar Sarge shakes the ropes, and Al is crotched for the DQ. So, excuse me, wasn't there a crotching in a match earlier that was not a DQ in The Undertaker when The Undertaker shook the match as Kane went up top? Yes. Yes. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Jim Ross outright said, we have seen this finish earlier in the show. Not to mention, Sarge is an official. Right. And they still disqualified <laughs> whoever here. Who gives a shit? Not to mention, at one point, Jared... Absolutely waffled Al Snow in the back with a oh, chair. The cop, I'm sure he caught him in the back of the head, too. Oh, yeah. Totally. So Jarrett loses via DQ and then leaves with Sarge, the man who cost him the match. This was an awful segment. It was so stupid. Everything about this was so stupid. Road Dog versus Mark Henry. I have completely forgotten this era where the outlaws are tag champs but hate each other. It already sucks. I, explain the reason that Road Dog brought a blow up doll to ring with him? You think I have a reason? I didn't have one. I was hoping one of you guys could explain. Brian, oh, you no, got I don't got any He idea. said his tag team partner was gone. Yeah. And so yeah, they're he mocking brought him. The, they're, they're burying Billy they're Gunn They're mocking here, Billy Gunn. Saying this, I guess saying this blow up doll is an adequate replacement for Which Billy Gunn. Which it Gunn. was. <laughs> it what? was It was in fact blown up. What was his duties I in the I guarantee DX? Kota Ibushi had a better match with a blow up doll than any match Billy Gunn had in all of the 90s. So the announcers here got a hold of some of, some of Henry's paperwork and they discovered he was suing China for sexual harassment. So we got Road Dog and Mark Henry. Do you know what happened in this match? I forget, honestly. China <laughs> decked D'Lo outside. Right. Shouldn't that be a DQ? It was earlier. A third fucking party <laughs> attacked somebody on the outside who wasn't in the match. This is so dumb. They can't keep anything straight. That's four times on this show. <laughs> That the rules just changed. Yes. Well, to be fair, Brian, although it was not a disqualification, the, di the referee did give China a thorough scolding. <laughs> yeah, this idiot referee. So, you know, it's like UFC. I guess earlier, maybe the referee was reprimanded for calling for the bell. And I so see. this referee was overcompensating. Was lenient. Yes. And so he starts yelling at China for five fucking minutes. And meanwhile, behind him, a dude's kicking another guy in the balls, like in your baseball game. Hits the X-Factor and wins. A third party, I might add. Mm -hmm. This show is just... There was a lot of stuff going on in this. <laughs> so, DX leaves. Henry recovers. He is pissed off. He grabs a chair and charges up the ramp, and that big fucker could move. <laughs> you know, it's not even like this is a bad show. It's just so infuriating as a fan trying to figure out what's going on. Why some things are legal here and not legal in this match. I could just see Vince Russo in the back just burning a rule book. Not even burning a rule book. But He's just so stupid that he, he just comes up with ideas and doesn't to, think. He has to write a new book, burn it, then write a new one and burn <laughs> that. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, it is time. Hey, go back to the hospital. You see, we're going to get some comments from Vince. First off, he wants more juice. He wants more juice, which I think he actually did mean juice. Yeah. He's upset that they're taking his blood pressure again. Let me talk about that part. So the nurse shows up, and she's got the blood pressure thing on Vince's arm. And Vince is just furious. He goes, God damn it, you've checked my blood pressure over and over and over again. It's always normal. You're checking it again. It's going to be normal again. I can't wait to get out of here. 
And she says, just relax. It'll only take a moment. Soon as she's done checking the blood pressure, Vince, who had been so furious, all of a sudden just goes, is it normal? <laughs> and she says, yes, it's normal. I thought that was so awesome. It is. It is. So the uh, nurse says, it's normal. Everything looks good to me. What do you think, doctor? At this point began what I am certain is the greatest 65 seconds in the history of Monday Night Raw's television show. I wrote the greatest moment in WWE history. There's, there is for sure, there's no debate that the greatest single moment, the greatest instant happens in the middle of all this. But I mean, start yes. to finish. Mm -hmm. You know how sometimes I'll say this was so great, I rewound and watched it again. Granted, this is relatively short. It didn't take much time. I watched this five times in a row. Knowing, by the way, because I had seen it when it first aired and watched it many times then. Dude, I've seen it a thousand I've times. I've seen it many times since. It never gets old. Never. I watched it and laughed my ass off. I watched it and laughed my ass off a second time. Then I watched it. I was a little more under control, but I was, I was studying it. I was going through this like the Zapruder film, frame <laughs> by frame. This is peak comedy. Slapstick comedians of around the world need to study this because it's so perfect. If they had shot this a thousand times, it would have been worse a thousand times. This was a perfect take. Well, I hate to break your momentum, but... Craig, stop him. It was Vince McMahon and Steve Austin. It's possible that if they did this a thousand times, all 1,000 would be awesome in completely different ways. It's true. So, the doctor, for the one guy listening to this who doesn't know what's happening here, the doctor is Steve Austin in disguise. He proceeds to beat up and torture Vince McMahon. <laughs> now, a lot of this I remembered vividly, mm. like when uh, uh, when Austin pounces on Vince on the gurney and starts throwing hammer fist to the knee or the, the ankle. Yeah. Vince's bug eyed screams of agony. I remember that vividly. Some of this I had forgotten, like when he zaps Vince with a defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't forget any of this. Vince sells this by he does the Undertaker sit up, waves his arms back and forth and lays back down. <laughs> But the best... The moment. Yes. I mean, and I even do mean the moment. That was the best thing I ever saw in my entire life. Vince is screaming and wailing. He's wailing because Austin moment. has been pummeling his bad ankle. He's <laughs> yes. in the middle of screaming over his bad ankle. Ah! 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 And Austin turns and grabs the most convenient weapon he can find, which happens to be a bedpan. Stainless steel, apparently. <laughs> yes, a metal, a metal bedpan because nothing helps you go <laughs> than cold steel up against your thighs. I guess not. And Austin <laughs> does a mighty overhand swing. I'm stunned he didn't take out the ceiling lights. Swings it over his head, brings it down on Vincent Man's skull. There is a great PANG sound, and Vince goes silent. I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. It is, ah, 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 bang! And then all you see is Vince frantically waving his hands in front of his face. <laughs> Five times in a row I watched this. Five times! You know the whole key to the bedpan is? Nobody who watches this will ever in their whole life forget the bedpan. No. It was one whack. Yeah. He did not whack him repeatedly. <laughs> no. He did not whack him 25 times. He did not whack him with, like, a big, hard steel chair. He found one stupid aluminum bedpan <laughs> that made a funny noise, and he whacked the guy one time in the head, and nobody will ever forget it. Because less is more. The when it's the perfect time, you only gotta whack the guy with the bedpan once. The cartoonish sound that the bedpan makes is... It totally makes the whole segment. Just the ping up against his skull. So the big payoff is... Austin grabs an enema and says something about how you're a pain in the ass, Vince, and I forget what he said, but he jams the enema up Vince's ass. He sodomized him. He, he did, yeah. Which, ironically, if there was anything I'd forgotten, it was that. <laughs> well, they needed something to end. They did, need, they did need some conclusion. Yes. This is much better than having Austin just walk away. He, he, he... Well, they didn't need to do this because they could have cut the camera at any time. Because mm -hmm. after he jammed it up his ass, like, the camera fell down and it goes yes. black. Yes, yes. So the other key to this is how unbelievably one-of-a-kind great Vince is at selling a man who is helpless 
in agony, in terror. He's begging for mercy. He's begging for help. But he's such a dick. You don't want him to get that mercy and help. The more he screams, the more they want. The more you want to see him beaten. Yeah, he was in no way a babyface here. No, <laughs> like he was assaulted in a hospital bed yes. in a cast. He was helpless by a crazed madman. He was ambushed, and all you can do is cheer the crazy guy. Gooned up on pills. He it was, was so. Sodomized. It was so he was awesome. Sodomized. And you don't feel bad for him. That's funny. Is the He's show the best villain ever? Show absolutely sucks every week, except when Steve Austin, The Rock, and Vince McMahon are on screen. And most of it, honest to God, it's mostly Vince McMahon and Steve Austin right now. Like Austin's, or, you know, Rock and Mankind, they're going to pick things up here in a while. But it's so funny to watch the Monday Night Wars, their show that they do on the network, and they add it on DVD. And they just make up all this bullshit about why they won the war, like that stupid DX invasion, which was so shitty. Like, you would think if you're going to, if you're going to make up history... Like, why even bother? Why don't you just say that the reason they won the Monday Night Wars was because Vince McMahon was a genius and the greatest performer of all time, outside of Steve Austin? Because that's the truth! God, this was great. I feel like we've undersold this. We have! <laughs> You're not doing nearly enough How justice. can you give enough credit to the greatest segment that they've ever filmed? If you are one of the small people listening to my voice who have not seen the segment... It's for, impossible. For, I know It is, but for the love of God, go watch it immediately. I'll repeat the date on this. Where did it go? October 5th. October, October 5th, 5, 1998. 1998. It was great. Main event is Undertaker versus The Rock. Taker's working him over. Dude, this was every Undertaker match you've ever seen where... Here's the thing with this match. So, we watch Raw nowadays. Well, Vinny doesn't. But it's three hours long and... Or even 205 Live. You get these long matches with a finish. And so because we see them all the time, there's like if you watch this match through modern eyes, there was nothing special about this match. It was a slow-paced Undertaker match. He worked the guy over forever. There was a screw job ref bump finish, and then Undertaker ends up winning. But if you look at this through the eyes of 1998, when most Raw main events didn't actually even happen, <laughs> and there was nothing but bait and switch, yeah. and all of these matches were really short and just bullshit DQs, countouts, no finishes, whatever. I mean, this must have been like, oh my god, Rock and Undertaker for 15 minutes with a finish? How lucky are we to have this on television? Top stars. There's intrigue at stake because last week Rock pinned Taker to th theoretically elevate him, and you, as a fan, you watch this thinking, will he, will he follow up on his big win? There's two things. Undertaker went for old school, and the fans didn't chant old school. Well, it was still, well, it wasn't old school yet. I, I know it he should have chanted new school. Well, it was it was, it was older <laughs> than that. It was just school. That's fair. <laughs> also, Undertaker let Rock kick out of a choke slam. He did. So they must have on his some, head too. They must. Like, yeah, oh yeah, his his uh, his thighs were higher than his head. Yeah. at one point, but uh, they had they had something big planned for Rock. Clearly, yeah. letting him kick out of that. Yeah. So Kane hits Taker with a chair, hard slides the chair into the ring. Rock hits a rock bottom, but there's no ref. Taker tombstones Rock under the chair, and the ref recovers to count three. So Taker screwed Kane. Kane tried to screw Taker, but fucked up. And I like to do these comparisons to today even though i do all the time but this earl hebner sold better as a referee than guys like dean ambrose do in 2017 <laughs> I, you ever notice that fucking he gets bumped he's down forever and when he finally starts to recover he does the slowest count of all time he's so injured he can barely slap the mat three times it's crazy that is a fact and he sold better than sting at the end of nitro <laughs> as well oh we'll get to this i guess we're here right now aren't we yes we are hey that Ross sucked, except the Vince McMahon segment was worth watching the whole show like 10 times. If I had to watch that show 10 times just to see that happen to Vince once, I'd do it. Oh, yeah. That's how great it was. All right, let's get going. Raw, real quickly before we get into this, what's our uh, review of every Raw in 1998? I don't know. I thought this one was pretty good. Everything sucks except Vince and Austin, which is well, awesome. I enjoyed this very much. Dude, this show is way better than usual. Way better than usual. I watched this show several days ago, but I'm going over my notes. I seem to hate it. So we'll see what happens. Hmm. Oh, man. Retro Raw 281, October 12th. 
two days after my birthday in 1998. By the way, someone mentioned, can you believe that the day that Impact kicks off their brand new streaming service my birthday it's on your birthday after they once planned their anniversary show on my birthday yeah i was gonna surprise you but my birthday present to you is i got you a subscription <laughs> my birthday present to you is craig's gonna punch you in the face <laughs> so now you can watch all of the classic do we have to wait till july hey Vinny, think about this not only do you have, not only can you watch all that impact but you can watch wrestling at the chase well that'd be cool actually That's see cool. exactly exactly because i am a good liar <laughs> all right Let's go. Craig, punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier tonight... It was a Nitro, right? It was a Raw. What do we normally start with? Raw. We do okay. All the time. Yeah. It's getting to the point How now... How many times have I asked what we start with and I get yelled at? I know, yeah. but but see, All here's what's happening. It's finally getting to the point where Raw is so much better than Nitro that I'm about ready to move it to the main event slot. I see. For a long time, <laughs> Nitro got the main event slot because it was better. I see. And then you got to remember that like Raw has been pretty terrible. For a long so time. it's neck and neck, so I haven't wanted to switch anything yet. Yeah. But if Raw continues to improve and Nitro continues to decline, they're going to switch. Oh, they are going to switch. Just then. like they did in Figure Four Weekly 19 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I never noticed that. Yep, yep. So earlier tonight, a car horn was frank frantically honking outside the building. The gate opens. Vince McMahon drives his convertible Corvette with WWF1 license plates into the building. Sarge and the Stooges are there to help him into his wheelchair like a Bond villain. And said, Vince is yelling at the idiot operating the garage door. Says, leave it open. I want to make sure Steve Austin gets in later. And he gets in his chair. He's driving along. He's cursing everyone. He's not happy how slow it goes. New Age Outlaws versus LOD 2000. Anybody notice that the big breakup angle with Billy Gunn and Road Dog just totally dropped? Yeah. And Billy, Billy Gunn, he comes out and Road Dog's doing his usual promo. And Road Dog just says one line like, sometimes friends have differences. And that's like the blow-off of the whole feud. Mm -hmm. His promo was essentially, we teased a breakup, but we changed our minds. And we're moving on. LOD 2000 here was Animal and Draws, with no explanation of why Draws was one of them now. Well, well because... they explained it on commentary. Yeah. Hawks, Hawks sobering up. Yeah, he's built up. And Animal said that it would be good if, if for the time being, he was, a, he was an alternate, he okay. said. So, Draws is replacing him. Why Draws? A big football, tough guy. Ugly. He's teamed with him before. He's perfect. <laughs> you sold me on ugly. And, yeah. And he has a bad haircut. Sure. Bad haircut, yes. So, yes, Hawk. And he did... vomits, just like Hall or Hawk. Hawk came and out. Hall. Hawk, <laughs> that's right, actually. Hawk came out in his face, paint and street clothes to do commentary. Talk about his painkiller habit and his addiction, which is now part of the, just part of the show. On the next pay per view, everyone, if you drop your money, you can't see in the comfort of your own home. All three dudes in LOD versus DOA and Paul Ellering. That sounds awful. And speaking of, like a minute in, DOA and Paul Ellering ran down and attacked Hawk. Draws the animal joined in. The headbangers appeared. They broke a boombox over Road Dog's head. The bell rang. They left. This is the set of the headbangers getting a title shot at the pay per view. Road Dog is bleeding everywhere. It barely made camera. This show is complete shit and not even 10 minutes old. Wow. I didn't think it was that bad. But I did like how the match is the New Age Outlaws versus Legion of Doom 2000. And they played DOA's music as everybody left. Even though they were just two geeks that interfered. Hmm. The announcer said that Triple H had been stripped of the Intercontinental title. They did not say why other than Vince is mad. Well, he's on crutches. Well, there's a, there's a clue. He's injured. It says there will be a tournament for the belt tonight. Vince and the Stooges are in an office watching a monitor backstage. They have the monitor tuned into the entranceway. Where who is entering but Kane in his tracksuit and mask? Hey, he finally wore his real mask this time. And That's uh, true. His, his creepy ski mask gimmick. I it, guess they took one look at that. And... It still never fails to make me laugh. Not the last ski mask we'll see on the show. Well, I suppose not. Steve Blackman versus Ken Shamrock in an Intercontinental title tournament match. Oh, man, here we go. One, <laughs> uh, by the way, it's a two-hour show. It's an eight-man tournament. It's a one-night tournament. Mm -hmm. So you can guess how long these matches are. Mm -hmm. The answer is short. They claimed Blackman had a bad leg. Shamrock was working it over, and after a brief comeback, he hooked a knee bar, and Blackman tapped out. At this point, who should hit the ring but the Blue Blazer? Sad, Sox. sad day. Attacked both men. He left. Shamrock got mad, put Blackman in the ankle lock again. Or for the first time, I guess. Different submission hold. 
yeah, I mean, it's not their fault that watching the Blue Blazer sucks now, but it sucks now. And even if it didn't, they had a match, a guy ran and attacked both men and left, and after the match is over, one of the guys attacked the other guy. There's <laughs> yeah. just too much going on. Well, you know, here's the thing when you watch a Vince Russo television show. If there's ever a moment where it seems like things are slowing down, something's going to happen. Because he believes if there's any, if there's one single moment where a fan gets bored, they're going to switch the channel. So he's got to just have nine billion things going on. A fine theory, shit in execution. I noticed Ken Shamrock in this match, former UFC fighter, just a wrestler. Yeah. He doesn't do any UFC. They, 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 they stripped him of all of that. Vinny and I, a few weeks ago, saw Matt Riddle wrestle live. Oh my gosh, can this guy take what he knew in UFC and 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 use it in a in a pro wrestling style fight? Well, he it's, started out as an MMA fighter and Ken Shamrock started out as a wrestler. Okay. So Shamrock just fallen back on what he knew. Plus, they figured no one knew any of this shit anyway. Okay, explain Tom who uses Yeah, but it's 2000 it's totally different now. Like people have been watching UFC since 95 so this was 98 eight i was gonna let him hang but um, actually I, I i paused because it was actually 93 that people started watching ufc but anyway the point is it was it was too early for them to understand all of this stuff i see like ken shamrock put the guy at one point ken shamrock puts a guy in a reverse triangle and the announcers had no idea what it was they were calling it like a neck hold it's like granny was calling the match <laughs> so you can imagine the fans that was Jim Ross that actually knew what he was talking about. Okay, that's Speaking fair. of Jim Ross, the Blue Blazer comes out, and normally when a guy is masked, like, nobody knows who he is. Blue Blazer comes out, and Jim Ross goes, oh my god, it looks like, it looks like, and I'm thinking, is he really going to say Owen Hart? And then he goes, it looks like the Blue Blazer. <laughs> no, it can't be. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's the fucking Blue Blazer. He's right there in front of you. That's the Blue Blazer. Because Owen had been the Blue Blazer. Yes. Yeah. I went to a, uh, a house show in uh, Tacoma when the Blue Blazer was at the height of his powers. and Some man had dressed up in a green outfit and had a large sign that said the Green Blazer. Well, hey. Different connotation. Right. Different kind of hero. Speaking of heroes, the Undertaker arrived at the building. Now, <laughs> it's not enough that he's got to wear the sweater and the sweatpants tucked into, like, army boots. <laughs> it's good he, look. He's just walking. No coat. It's October at night. He's just walking down the ramp. Nobody's following him. He has no bags. He has no car. Does he just walk the earth? He's the dead like man. Like Kane and Kung Fu? He's the dead man. Well, you know, first off, I was glad he wasn't wearing a backpack, because that would have really set me off. But I, I, I do love the idea that he just got like a cab and <laughs> and he was like just drop me off in front of the building i'll walk i'll walk in from here the goddamn door's open it's a, it's a it's a bay door with a ramp that you drive a you could drive a cement truck down that thing as we were to see undertaker just gets dropped off outside the building and wanders on in where's his stuff i don't know did he drop it off earlier did he I, ship it ahead he shipped it ahead i he's guess he's so important that they make the wwe drag it around for him hmm. i can actually buy that Terry was about to give Val Venus a hand job in the arena steps. We got a gold dust highlight video showing him destroying Razor Ramon and Roddy Piper. And when I say destroying, he just beat them and beat them and beat them in these highlights. It was actually funny. Val Venus versus Mark Merrow in a tournament match. <laughs> announcers, this won't mean anything to Brian, it may not mean anything to Craig. When the announcers were talking about college football games, I mentioned Ron Dane, and I thought that was two decades ago. <laughs> that made me feel old. It is my birthday. So, in a two-minute match, Jacqueline took the ref, Terry distracted Marrow, Val had a fisherman suplex and won, Jacqueline tackled Terry on the floor, Geeks came out to separate them. Dude, you want to talk about Ken Shamrock not using any MMA? Jackie knocks her to the ground and starts trying to take her back. I couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> and then she kind of falls off of her back and, and uh, ends up in the guard. She grabs her arm. I could not for the life of me. This was the most bizarre catfight of the 90s. You know, her top is... That's where I was going with this. Is, 
it's how much structurally tape. structurally this is amazing it's holding that much mass yeah the the, the, the yards of tape this was required right. to keep everything inside and it almost failed well almost it still counts Paul Paul Bearer arrived with a briefcase this made Vince upset for some reason Michael Cole tried to interview Sable it was hysterical because he says basically Sable your thoughts and Sable responds by walking away from him, which I imagine many women have done. And she went to go find it. Jacqueline drags out to the arena. Sable had even more tape than Jacqueline, and they just brawled and Dude, brawled they had for a another, while. they had another Jackie's inner guard throwing shots. It was a serious deal here. It was a fracas, they said, with boobies everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I believe they were held in. And for that reason, they replayed the brawl after the break. I was stunned when I watched this, and I go back and I go to my notes now. It's Sable. Of course they did. Mankind versus Mark Henry in a tournament match. They were in Long Island, so some cheers for Mankind, although not as many as you'd think. Well, before they had this match, Mankind does this promo where he pulls out Mr. Sacco, the place goes nuts. Mankind literally buries Ken Shamrock because he can't swing a chair hard enough. Yep. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Nope. Henry cut a promo. It was just a love poem he recited to China. So she came out 10 seconds into the match. Okay, so if you <laughs> filed yeah. a sexual harassment lawsuit against somebody, mm -hmm. would you then go on national television and recite a love poem to them? I'm going to assume Mark Henry's legal counsel probably did a facepalm when his yeah. poem aired. He may have weakened his own case. You don't say. Yeah. Highlight of this match was Mankind legitimately tripping over Henry's foot on an Irish whip. You sure that's what happened? Pretty sure. Because he... I thought he had his leg kind of worked over and then he took his shoe off like he had, had a broken ankle. Because he went to whip Henry in, Henry reversed it, fully tripped over his foot and went down, and then they just got back up and did the same thing. It was weird. Yeah. Regardless, he hits the DDT, Foley does, and he goes to pull out the sock. And fans can see where this is going. They're starting to cheer. Sock was already over. And he debuts the Socko Claw, Takes the so does take the sock off his own foot, he uses the Socko Claw to win. One week, he got this over. He's great. Yeah. <laughs> now, write that down. This is the best match of the night so far, and it involved the winner tripping like a goof right before the finish. I'm glad he moved to putting it in his pants instead. This dirty sock on his foot into a dude's mouth. No, no. So you would rather? It's too much even for me. Anyway. Well, it could be outside the gear. Yeah, it could be sure. outside his gear, but inside his pants. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't have to be, you know, wrapped around his nutsack. I prefer it was not. I bet he would prefer it was not. But everyone would prefer it wasn't. Yeah. China confronted Henry, who blew her off and walked away. Hello. He said, it's out of my hands. Mm -hmm. Another thing here. So if you're going to file like a sexual harassment lawsuit against somebody, wouldn't you also like have a restraining order involved? Absolutely. She's right there in the ring in his face. This guy needs a better attorney. <laughs> it's almost as if the person writing this so didn't know what they were doing. It's funny because you think he'd be slapped with one of these. <laughs> That's actually a good point. A cement truck drove into the building. Steve Austin climbed out, surveyed the scene, and climbed back in. They go to break. They come back. Cole tries to interview Austin. Austin said he had an invitation to arrive. Said he hoped Vince was paying attention. What he was going to do would be of interest to the McMahon family. Vince saw this, ordered the Stooges to go check it out, and Sarge got up, tripped, and fell onto Vince's ankle. They are great heels. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett versus X-Pac in an Intercontinental title, uh, Tournament match. The first minute of this match, everything they did was off. One guy was out of position, or they just both fucked it up. But they were better fucking stuff up than the 1998 version of Mark Henry was getting everything right. So I enjoyed this. Well, you know, the X-Pac was in it. Mm -hmm. Where's Farmer when I need him? <laughs> Somebody on the board made the comment that, and everyone talks about what a great wrestler Jeff Jarrett was, but aside from the match with Shawn Michaels... <laughs> Name another great Jeff Jarrett match. None, none come to mind. None of them come to mind. Hmm. Well, you know, that's maybe that's because there were other guys better than Jeff Jarrett. Are you gonna call Matt and play the show for him so you can argue? No, I'll I'll let him know when I see him. I saw it live. It's not worth it. You know how uh, some things never change. When we watch these shows. Jerry Lawler's making jokes about the Yankees and the Indians in the playoffs. Amazing. So let's see. X-Pot goes for a Bronco Buster. Jarrett catches him with a boot right to the nuts. 
And Jarrett rolls outside, grabs a guitar case. Yeah, for the first time in his damn career, he puts his guitar in a case. Never, Never happened before. Never happened before. And of course, he opens the case and the guitar's on it. He is 0 for 1 on keeping the guitar in the guitar case. What was in it was head. Jarrett was distracted. X-Pac rolled him up and pinned him. Al Snow ran in, grabbed head and ran away. And then Jim Ross and said Al and Jarrett had a budding rivalry, apparently. Uh, apparently. I mean, I don't know. I will say, though, that we are we must believe as fans that Jeff Jarrett, before the show, walked down to ringside surreptitiously with his guitar case and hid it under the ring. Mm -hmm. And somewhere else, Al Snow saw this and knew that he had a plan for later. And he snuck down, removed the guitar, and put head in it. Mm -hmm. Knowing that when Jarrett opened the case, he would be so surprised to see a head that he would be rolled up and pinned in the wrestling match. Yes. I don't buy this for a second. He's a master criminal. Like Heath Ledger's Joker. He Not for a second. Eight steps this. ahead of everybody. They go backstage. Vince is looking on helplessly. Austin fills the Corvette with cement. It fills and fills and fills. All the windows break. They keep cutting to Vince for reaction shots. And Austin gets off and storms off. Took 128 start to finish. It felt like to the back. Here it's done. To the break. This is the third historic moment in three straight weeks we've seen after the Zamboni and the hospital attack. Zamboni was still great. Hospital attack was maybe even better than I remembered. This left me underwhelmed. Well, you know, they, they destroyed a $50,000 car, they said, and it was to the back. Yeah. They built it up so much. They were talking about Vince had, you know, a dozen of these things and he was going to put it in a show later that weekend. He was driving in the rain with the top down as douchebags do. <laughs> well, you know, what you got to remember here is that the Zamboni involved Vince getting his ass kicked and the hospital involved Vince getting his ass kicked. And this involved his car getting filled with cement. Well, it was spectacular. I mean, there, there's the shot, as someone mentioned on the board, the, 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 the weight of the cement pushes the windows outside and snaps them. Sure. But they cut to Vince before the glasses even hit the ground. They, nothing about this was allowed to sink in. And in fact, when Austin gets out of the truck and walks away, cement's still pouring out. The job was not yet done. Right. Uh, it was very rough. Well, the job was done all right. I was, it was done. His he car was, was gone. Done. But I would have freaked out if he dropped a chocolate bar on my interior. So that's just me. That sounds like a dare. Vinny, mm -hmm. please don't. <laughs> so, Austin comes out for a promo. He says Vince has screwed him. This sealed Vince's fate. He will make Vince's life a living hell as long as they are both in the company. Out comes Vince on stage. He is accompanied by a mysterious masked bodyguard and cops with dogs. And Austin storms up the ramp. Vince orders the dogs to bark. They bark at each other. Austin's flipping off and mocking the dogs. Yes. That was a highlight. I don't think this went like they had planned. I'm sorry, that was not the highlight. The highlight is still to come. Yes. Well, Vince cuts a promo. <laughs> Says this is part of his Corvette collection. He's so angry, he books Austin and Rock against Taker and Kane later. Warns Austin to have eyes in the back of the head, back of his head. Uh, he blames Austin for what Taker and Kane did to his ankle. And really, that was the point where he really, really got going in this promo. Due to this ankle injury, he may never play polo again. Starts lamenting his sad sack life. He may never get on a horse. He recaps everything that happened in the hospital. My rectal area. You hit notes. me with a bedpan, shocked me with a defibrillator, violated my rectal area, and then he emphasizes that damn open hospital gown. That was funny. He said on Sunday... If Austin refuses to raise the hand of a new WWF champion, Vince will fire him on the spot. Austin says, you don't have the balls to do that. And here, for I believe the first time, Vince said he had balls the size of grapefruits. He threatened again to fire Austin on Sunday. Now hit the music! And he said, you will be humbled this Sunday. Mm -hmm. You will either raise the hand of the winner on the spot, or I guarantee that I will fire your ass. Now hit my music. This was the best promo of the 90s. <laughs> this is awesome. I was behind. I watched it three times. <laughs> I'm going to watch it again when the show is over. I love Steve Austin. I love The Rock. I love Ric Flair. But on this day, 
this promo, I was convinced that Mr. McMahon is the greatest character in the history of wrestling. He's the best. He was unbelievable. What character? I'm not saying like wrestler, overall performer. What character in wrestling history is better than Mr. McMahon? One does not exist. No. It does not exist. As far as Vince is concerned, he is 100% innocent, and he is 100% a victim. You cannot believe the cruel hand of fate has put Steve Austin into his life, and all the terrible things that have happened ever since. Like, listen, Steve Austin was the biggest star of the 90s, one of the biggest stars in all of wrestling, and he would have been awesome with or without McMahon, but there is no way he would have been as awesome without Vince McMahon. Vince was the absolute perfect foil for Steve Austin. Nobody would have been better. What goofy heel do they have on the roster that could have been a better foil for Steve Austin? One does not exist. Vince McMahon is the greatest of all time. Best character ever. God, this promo was so great. We had Val Venus versus Ken Shamrock in the tournament match. So they're doing this match... They're wrestling, and they're going back and forth, and Val makes a comeback, and then Ken makes a comeback, and it's like, it's a slap in the face. Is there a baby face here? Who am I supposed to be cheering for? Well, here's the thing. So, we thought Ken Shamrock turned heel, but in this match, Jim Ross goes, Shamrock has been getting a smattering of boos. <laughs> like, he's still a baby face, but people are turning on him. I guess? So apparently he did not do a hard turn, as they call it. Mm. This was a soft turn that he did the pay-per-view or whatever. I'm pretty sure he's supposed to still kind of be a babyface, but he's definitely turning heel. But Val Venus, at the same time... Oh, Val's a babyface. Is he? He's 100% a babyface. Are we sure about this, yep, Vinny? I'm In not. the 90s? No. Yeah, he's a babyface. So, well, well... Okay, so who's he feuding with? He's feuding with Goldust. You're right. telling me Goldust is a babyface? No. Goldust is definitely a I'm heel. saying neither of them are. Well... And neither is Shamrock. Shamrock, in the opening match in this tournament... Attacked a guy after he'd beaten him because some other guy beat him up. In the 90s, in WWF, a heel that is a porn star that stole another heel's wife and is getting hand jobs backstage at every show. Trust me, the dude's a babyface. So Val if Venus, you steal somebody's wife... Did I not just say in the face. 90s in WWF? Okay. That's a babyface thing. I was watching this and it occurred to me every single person on Raw in 1998 is a total asshole. Yes. Shamrock attacked Val in this match before they got to the ring. Uh -huh. Yeah, Shamrock's definitely turning heel. So anyway, the the funniest thing, I, I, funny thing, funny thing, Shamrock hooks a, uh, was it a knee bar? He hooks a leg hold. It was the ankle lock. Hooks the ankle lock, and Val just taps out clean. Yeah. Clean submission tap outs were still very strange to see in 1990. Well, they had to get this goddamn tournament over with. I guess so. <laughs> so Shamrock wins. Uh, Goldust come out as his whole entrance. Val can't... Okay, here's... Okay. <laughs> this goes to Brian's point about Goldust not being a babyface. Val can't even stand. He is helpless. Terry's there, a tiny little woman. She, of course, is no good in any fight against Goldust. Not that anyone wanted to see that fight. So she leaves. Goldust beats up the already beaten and injured Val, hangs him in the ropes, and kicks him right in the balls. Everyone on the show sucks. Well, Val's a babyface. I can tell you that much. In this weird universe. There is one guy who has figured out that everyone else on the show is an asshole. When everyone else zigs, I'm going to zag, and that's going to get me over. That's Mankind. Vince and his crew are looking over the ruined car, and Mankind arrives. The car is completely covered in cement. Yes, it is filled filled to the brim. It it's is poured out all over the sides. You know, what, in all seriousness, how much... I mean, the car is ruined. That's a total loss. How much do they have to pay the arena to clean this up? Probably plenty. <laughs> that couldn't have been cheap either. Sergeant Slaughter looks at Vince and he says, your briefcase is still in there. And they're all trying to figure out what to do. And Briscoe says, we could get a shovel, Mr. McMahon. That's his plan. Yeah. Let's get a shovel. And Foley arrives and says, oh, I'm sure we can salvage something. First of all, he's trying to shine a light on the whole thing. He's trying to put a positive spin on it. We can salvage something. He starts digging through the cement with his bare hands to get the keys to get the yeah. keys <laughs> which what the hell are you going to do with the well, keys well you can unlock the door I guess it's a convertible so <laughs> I'm sure this was ad-libbed but 
I guess he found the keys, but they are having a conversation about what he had found as they went to break. Rock could have promo when they came back. Rundowns Taker, Kane, and Austin. D'Lo and Henry interrupt, and they want to know, why are you not teaming with us? And I thought, it's not his fault. Vince booked the match. He didn't ask for anything. Rock tells them to know the role. We can go talk about it outside. And they did. Mankind versus X-Pac in an intercontinental match. Mankind's out there with bits of cement on his gear and body. So can we confirm after this match that in fact Ken Shamrock is a heel as he whacks poor Mankind in the leg with a chair as I both haven't. guys are brawling outside the ring? That did happen, I, yes. I thought it two weeks ago. So yes, we can. So yeah, Shamrock is a heel. He attacks Foley in the leg with a chair. X-Pac gets a schoolboy for the win. And then Shamrock starts destroying X-Pac and working over his neck. So they go to break, they come back, Xbox still down, Triple H is out there on crutches. They both insist the match go on, and so it's Ken Shamrock versus Xbox in the in the uh, tournament final. Here, Xbox yell the F word as loud as possible with the camera right in his face. My favorite. I believe you, I don't. My, it was right when he goes, ring the goddamn bell. Yep. My favorite part of this is they have Triple H on crutches out there for commentary. And Shamrock, they go back and forth, it's fine. And finally, X-Pac makes his comeback. Shamrock puts him in the ankle lock. X-Pac starts fighting for the ropes. Shamrock pulls him back to the middle. X-Pac will not give up. He continues to fight to the ropes. He's crawling. Triple H says, One thing I know, this man will never quit. <laughs> Shamrock yanks him back to the middle. He quits. Hunter's like, Damn it! That's, that is how it went down. Damn it! <laughs> I also loved X-Pac as loud as he could, yelling at the ref to tell him to yank him back to the middle of the ring. Totally rushed tournament. Not horrible. And, uh, the, and the winner won clean. The winner won decisively. So I'm a, I'm a fan of clean uh, wins in the end, in tournaments. Three wins in this match, and they were all decisive. There was no bullshit involved. He just won. So he's the Intercontinental Champion. As soon as the bell rings, Mankind goes out there with a chair to protect X-Pac, but Shamrock now, he's, he's won. For Shamrock, the battle is won. He doesn't need to fight anymore. So he goes away. And the gimmick is, on Heat, Hunter will have to present the title personally to Ken Shamrock. Oh, but wow. that goes off well. What a great idea. May uh, as well have Austin raise the hand of the winner on Sunday. I'm sure that's <laughs> going to go well. Undertaker and Kane versus Steve Austin and The Rock. In 1998, it was just, hey, let's put the main event guys in a tag match. You read those four names in 2017, it's like, how did that not main event WrestleMania? Yeah. <laughs> What an insane match. Paul Bearer comes out about a minute in. Ross says he is allegedly Kane's father, but he had not seen a DNA test. What the hell did he come out for? Well, I don't know. But my like point at the is, end of the day, no, my point is at the end of the day, he was here the whole show yeah. with a briefcase, mm -hmm. came out here at the end, mm -hmm. and like the show's over now, and I have no idea why he was there. Maybe but, they ran out of time. I want to know why did Jim Ross forget that he did do a DNA test? We all saw it. Yep. That's right. Ross is f completely forgotten. I do not blame Jim Ross or anybody for forgetting anything with this stupid Undertaker Kane storyline. It is spot I remembered clear as day 20 years later. Rock is about to do the people's elbow. Taker does the zombie setup mid move. Rock just kicks him back down and hits the elbow anyway. It's great. Taker, Taker cut him off with a choke slam. The greatest choke slam of all time was uh, one Taker gave to Brock in their feud in like 2003 or whatever that was. When Brock jumped so high, Taker almost lost him. This was the second best choke slam of all time. Rock got so high for this one. They're beating on Rock. Mark Henry and D'Lo are out there too. Finally, Austin gets the hot tag. He's making his comeback, and Henry and D'Lo begin to attack The Rock. What's going on? What happened? Well, we do know that The Rock is facing Henry on Sunday. I see. And they're mad that he's teaming with Austin, mm -hmm. even though... Vince commanded it. Yes. And, uh, and and Rock has been belittling them and telling them to know their role. They finally snapped. That's what I got out of this. I see. Well, they need a leader. Farouk left them, and now The Rock is leaving them. Well, they, they left Rock. Yeah. They don't know The Rock's lead, leaving them. It's kind of a dick. Which, by the way, why is Rock facing Mark Henry? Oh, I didn't know that until you told me. Yeah. They Are explained you? it, but I, I, I don't know why. Hmm. I don't either. I can't think of a good reason. For the record, with all these Hall of Famers out there, the crowd was chanting, D'Lo sucked. So there's a big fight going on, and then the masked security guard runs in, attacks Austin for the DQ, immediately unmasks to reveal the big boss man. 
And Vince and his crew were getting their jollies laughing for, from the stage. The beating goes on for a while. Taker has Austin in a knee bar for a long time. And then the show ends. And it's time for Extra Attitude, which was the least sucky Extra Attitude they have seen. Yep. So Taker and Kane leave. Boston is choking out Austin. He leaves. Vince figures Austin is dead. He wheels himself down to the ring, orders the Sto Stooges to, quote, put the boots to him, which I love that expression. He also says, Sarge, do you want a shot? And Sarge declined politely, <laughs> which is funny. So Austin makes a comeback, and it's Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson bumping for Steve Austin, so it is golden. He stuns them both. Rock returns, and he hits a double people's elbow. Vince tries to flee. <laughs> I, I like to think this is not planned. No, there's no way it was planned. <laughs> Vince goes to flee, but he's got the motorized wheelchair, and there's like the little lip on the ramp, so it won't get. It, it won't. It's not strong enough to go up over the limp and get onto the ramp. My, my only thought was the battery had actually died. That's also possible too, but he's pushing forward, pushing forward. It won't go. So Austin just comes out, grabs the chair, and dumps it backwards. <laughs> Eventually, they get Vince up there. He looks like he wants to cry. Austin leaves. They put Vince back in his chair. He falls out several times. Every time he calls the Stooges a son of a bitch. Finally, they have to help him walk up the ramp, and the, the the subtle genius in all this is Patterson and Briscoe helping Vince walk up the ramp. Vince is on the verge of tears, and they've left the wheelchair behind, but due to the damage to the rectal area, Pat Patterson has remembered to bring the hemorrhoid pillow. Mm -hmm. This was funny. I didn't see any of it. Yeah, we were watching up here with you and it just went off. It just off. ended. It it's strange. like it was in the middle of extra attitude and then it said, in five seconds, the next raw. And you were fine with this. And I was like, all right, whatever. I don't know why I did that. But anyway, so according to Wikipedia here, this uh, In Your House Judgment Day on October 18, 1998, they have a background here which explains all of the feuds. Nowhere here does it explain why Rock is facing Mark Henry. <laughs> but I will read what happened in the match. This from Wikipedia. Despite being introduced together with D'Lo Brown, Mark Henry entered the ring on his own and dedicated a poem to China. The Rock's dynamic opening attacks proved too much for Henry, and even managed to suplex the super heavyweight. However, on the outside of the ring, Henry used a, a, his weight to push Rock against the ring and then slam him against the broadcast table. Henry further used his weight by leaning on the Rock, choking him against the middle rope, Dude. <laughs> and keeping the match's pace at a slower rate. After blocking a series of punches and then returning them, Rock scoop slammed Henry into the ground. Sounds serious. To perform the people's elbow. However, D'Lo Brown ran to ringside, and as Rock punched him, Henry caught Rock from behind and pinned him with a big splash, with Brown leaning in the ring to hold down his feet, stopping him from kicking out of the pin. So prior to Rock winning the world title, he did a job on a random in your house, in a random match, to Mark Henry. How stupid. And that was the semi-main event. <laughs> that went on second to last. Five minutes and six seconds. Well, Nitro. Boy. Listen, can somebody tell me why Rock and Mark Henry had a match? No. I need to know. There's no answer. I'm asking the listeners, Vinny, not you. I'm, I'm, I'm answering the question for you. No, there is no answer. I'm sure there's an answer. Since we're going into Nitro. This, I mean, it was signed. This first. Dura first, as is custom. Retro Raw number 282, October 19th, 1998. They recapped the end of the pay-per-view the night before. So for those of you who forget or were not around, it was Taker versus Kane for the vacant championship with Steve Austin as ref. And it ended... With a double pin, Austin counted both men out and declared himself world champion. Yeah. And so Vince, as he had guaranteed, came out at the end of the show and said, Screw you, Austin. You're fired. That was the end of the pay-per-view. Hey, he guaranteed it. He did. There's that word again. This leads us to In the Arena. They played Good Times Are Here Again. The whole roster glumly came out and filled the ring as black balloons and black confetti fell from the sky. Which is kind of creepy, actually. So, nothing happened for a while. The guy's just standing there. There's empty TV time. Like, a minute passes, and finally Vince and his cronies come out. Big Boss, Big boss Man put his mask back on for some reason. Maybe he's just cold. 
So Vince said it's Austin's fault there's no champion, but he guaranteed there would be a champion at the end of the Survivor Series because there would be a 16-man one-night tournament for that belt. He ordered the, uh, the truck to put a freeze frame of Austin's face up on the screen at the moment Vince fired him. And Vince said Austin had mumbled something about hunting season, but the only thing he's hunting for now is a job. He said firing Austin had been better than sex. Warned everyone in the ring not to cross him. He did admit Steve Austin merchandise was still selling like crazy because now it was a collector's item. But the new catchphrase was, McMahon 316 says, I've got the brass to fire your ass. At this point, the freeze frame of Austin faded away into a live shot of Steve Austin. He was in a truck. He was wearing camos. He was carrying a big fucking gun. This goddamn guy's got an assault rifle in his vehicle. <laughs> Just hanging out. This was so uncomfortable. <laughs> like, it's so preposterous that we're sitting here laughing about how preposterous it is. Can you imagine on Raw Monday... If somebody would have gotten fired and they showed up outside the building in a truck in camo with an assault rifle, this would never fucking fly. No. They did a show long storyline where Steve Austin was going to kill. He was going to assassinate Vince McMahon. Murder. On live television. He was going to. With a gun. He was going to end a human life or perhaps a bow and arrow or a knife. But he's going to violently end a man's life on live TV. That was the show long storyline. There's a lot of detail into this, which we shall get into as it unfolds. So they go to break. Vince is, as you can imagine, upset at the threat that this maniac is going to kill him. He orders the boss man, get my family out of town immediately. Boss man obeys orders and leaves. Vince then orders the camera crew to stay with him. He wants everything documented. So Austin knows he won't get away with anything. Meanwhile... Austin is sitting in his truck. The door is open. He's just cleaning his gun. Were there open carry laws in Wisconsin in 1998? Apparently there were, yeah. Just sitting there. Ken Shamrock versus X-Pac, because even though there's a guy threatening to kill his boss going on, we're still going to have some wrestling matches. Hey, here's something to think about. They announced that next week, not on Raw, but on Heat... Motley Crue was going to be there. <laughs> yes. That tells you how many viewers Sunday Night Heat had when it first debuted. Yeah. Like, four million people. More people were watching Heat than are watching Raw today. Oh, yeah. And SmackDown. It was so big that Motley Crue was not going to show up on Raw. They were going to show up on Heat. <laughs> it's amazing. Blows my mind. Yeah. So, speaking of Motley Crue, first of all, they showed uh, Shamrock slamming Triple H's knee in a car door on heat. This is when it occurred to me. I had forgotten this. But DX formed in late 97 and was around... Well, Hunter was around until the uh, early part of 1999. Almost two years. He was injured for most of that run. I totally forgot well, this. Well, you know, some people are injury prone... And some people just get a lot of injuries. I guess. Yes. I guess. What I loved about this was this was a Vince Russo special where they have a match. Two dudes come out and handcuff China and take her away. Yeah. And then Mankind comes out. All this bullshit. And all I could think was, this is a champion versus champion match. And they don't think they can hold the audience's attention. No. And so we're going to have two different people run in during this match. In three minutes. And the announcer's talking about how there's a guy outside with a gun who's going to kill the boss. Yeah. Can they just start really winning already so we can get over this? In fact, let's go back to something you said just a second ago. Two police officers came out, put China in handcuffs, and led her to the back. Yeah. Meanwhile... There is a man with a gun who has said, I am going to kill someone. Well... They're not arresting him. I don't think he said that yet. I see. He's only stated that he's going hunting. I see. She clearly has has violated her restraining order or whatever. I guess so. Did we mention, by the way, that when they plugged the Motley Crue appearance, DX crashed Motley Crue's tour bus and came off like the biggest dorks of all time? Well, yeah. 
Yeah, they were not as cool as Motley Crue. So, yeah, uh, what the hell was the finish? Mankind, Mankind gets out. in the ring, puts him in the mandible claw right in front yes. of the referee. Yes, I was just laughing by this Who point. does not call for the DQ. I was just laughing my ass off. And Shamrock lays him out, turns around, gets an X Factor for the pin. This yeah. was complete shit. Yes. There's no nice way to say it. Speaking thereof, DX tries to t stop the cops from taking China away. They fail. X-Pac says, this is bullshit, right on camera. So they all leave. Then the security guards say, hey, what's that? And they go to investigate Steve Austin. Austin shows them one of his guns, then shows them another of his guns. He's very friendly to them, while signing autographs, asking about their kids and everything. They admire his weapons, they hand them back, and they leave. They cut back to Vince. <laughs> the what in the hell kind of town is this? He's got a great question. He's so great. And it was a great question. What in the hell kind of town is this? So they go to break. No, before that. Hmm? Vince sends one of the cops. He's got a fat cop there. With a dog. It looks like the He looks like the fat ref in Ring of Honor. Okay, yeah. Tells him to go arrest Austin. This officer, unlike the other two officers, is concerned. So concerned that instead of going to arrest Steve Austin, he says, and I quote... I didn't come here to endanger my own life. Screw you. And he leaves. <laughs> this is what happened. So as Vince asked astutely, what in the hell kind of town is this? This is bullshit. <laughs> so much bullshit. If Austin had actually murdered Vince in the show, it would have been so unfair. I like the idea that Steve Austin said, listen, I know the guy fired me. I know he's an asshole. I hate the guy. But even though I have all these guns here, I've got a gun with a flag that says bang, and I'm just going to trick him. So go ahead and just go about your business. And they went, sure, Mr. Austin, we trust you. I guess. You know, they pointed that out. There was the line where they're going over his guns, and he says one of them is a nice little toy. Yeah. Maybe that's what he meant. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Headbangers versus LOD 2000. I know people have laughed at me when I said the New Age Outlaws were big stars. We've had some fun of, with Billy Gunn on this show, but you don't realize how great the New Age Outlaws are until you watch the headbangers try to make fun of their entrance. Oh, my God. So it's Animal and Darren Drozdov as Legion of Doom. The headbangers nearly killed Droz, dropping a right on his head with a double gourd buster. A four-way broke out. Hawk begins to clap for Draws. Draws gets distracted. And the headbangers schoolboy him and pin him. One of the best headbangers matches I ever saw. Draws is mad at Hawk. Yeah. Hawk pleads innocent. Animal's mad at them both. Animal's mad at both it's of just, them. It's also stupid. Hawk didn't do anything wrong. He clapped. It was very weird. He clapped his hands together. Yeah. And this outraged the guy who pukes. No, look at me. So... <laughs> It took me a while to figure out what happened in this next segment. But what it was, was the rats got off the sinking ship. It's Patterson, Briscoe, and Sarge there with Vince. And they've realized, you know what? Austin's going to kill this guy. The cops aren't doing anything. They're getting out of here. What the hell am I sticking around for? So Pat says, you know what? I think I could use some coffee. Anybody else want some coffee? And Briscoe and Sarge are like, you know what? I'll go with you. And they all leave Vince alone. And Vince is horrified to realize he is, in fact, alone. It's him and the camera crew who are, in fact, not going to help him. And he's terrified now. There's then a knocking on Vince's door. He panics. He's not sure what to do. He tries to flee. But at the door, it is, in fact, Mr. Sacco offering to be a new head of security. Vince is so desperate for help. Any friendly face. He invites mankind in. Just have someone there to watch, watch his back. And so Mankind comes in and sits down on the couch and says, we should get to know each other. Let me go to break. Undertaker comes out for a promo. So Paul Bearer, I did not mention this, at the pay-per-view, he had turned on Kane and teamed with Taker. I don't know why. Well, I guess they tried to explain it. Taker explained that Paul was despicable, evil, and maniacal, which is why he wanted to team with Paul. Taker was just bumbling through this promo it was here. Not very good. It was not very good. He used the term Ministry of Darkness for the first time. Yep, he announced the Ministry of Darkness, and he's 
burying Kane. And this leads to Jim Ross. There's one man. <laughs> Paul, Paul, I should mention, Paul Bearer was burying Kane. Yes. Which leads to Jim Ross. There is one man in this world who could pull off this line. <laughs> Paul buries Kane, mm -hmm. saying he's used him his entire life. Kane turned on him twice. He'll never have any use for him again. And Jim Ross just says, he's your son, for God's sake, you rotund demon. Just like that. Rotund? You rotund demon. Demon. And he said it with such passion. He meant it. I was like, he is a fucking rotund demon. Jim Ross is right. So Undertaker, as I wrote here, rambled on in nonsensical melodramatic terminology about unleashing a plague or something. He announced he had set the fire that killed his parents. Because Kane had been weak as a child, and he was weak now, and only the strong would survive. So, you have Austin outside saying, I'm going to kill someone. A taker in the ring saying, I ha I killed someone, and China's the one who gets arrested. None of the fans had any idea what to make of any of this promo. They didn't hate it, they didn't boo it, they didn't cheer it, they just sat there saying, what the fuck? And then Kane comes out, he wheels a casket onto the stage, uses a voice box to challenge, to challenge Taker to a casket match tonight. Says Taker will rest in peace. Mankind tries to convince Vince to rehire Austin so the three of them and Mr. Sacco could form their own clique. And Vince says he cannot rehire Austin as a matter of principle. So Mankind says, okay, let's play some games. And he reaches into his bag, they fade to break, and they come back to commercial, the camera is zoomed in on Mankind's broad, flat ass. Now I needed some lunch or something, I had pause, I got to do whatever I was doing, then my wife came home, she looks at my computer, there is Mick Foley's giant ass on the screen. <laughs> of course it did. Of course it did. So Mankind's playing Twister. There's the joke. Vince doesn't want to play Twister. He can barely walk. He can't walk. He's in a wheelchair. Getting angry. He says this is not making him feel better. And if he can take no more, he snaps, orders Mankind to leave him alone. Leave him alone. Take his stupid crap, crap with him. He's in danger, damn it! And so Mankind leaves and Vince is alone again. Steve Blackman versus Jeff Jarrett with... In her WWE debut, Deborah McMichael. That's right. Fans chant, show your tits. She doesn't. <laughs> I wrote that down too. Blue Blazer runs in to attack Blackman. Fans are already chanting Nugget. Mm -hmm. They figured this out. And then Al Snow runs down with Head. But he's distracted by Deborah. And Jeff Jarrett breaks a guitar over the back of his head. Yeah. Is there anybody... I mean, I'm not counting like Balls and Mahoney and guys in ECW... Is there anybody in WWE that's probably caused more concussions in the 90s than Jeff Jarrett with that fucking guitar? This is bad. Dude, he waffles guys every single solitary week. And I know it's a gimmicked guitar. I know they take out like the, the inside. There's like a there's like an inside, like whatever you want to call it. But if you take that out, then it's just like the thin back of the guitar. Mm -hmm. But still, you're smashing that over the dude's head hard enough to break the uh, neck of the guitar. Dude, to the back of the head. Yeah. Every single part of this segment sucked. It was terrible, except Deborah. I will say one thing about her. Uh, two things, actually. First of all, what was up with her hair? Don't there, ask there, me. There like, she I was, didn't notice. It was like there's a hurricane going on, and they just sprayed her with hairspray in the middle of it. I also liked when Jim Ross referred to her as that young lady. She was 38. Anyway, yeah, that was that. So Vince is scared and alone backstage. The phone rings. He hesitates, but he answers, and we can hear the phone. It's Austin. He says Vince's time is up, and he's coming to get him. The crowd loved this. After the break, Vince is on the phone. We can hear the call again. Talking to his limo driver. Says, back the car up. Leave the engine running. Leave the back door open. And if Austin shows up, scream. This is all shot in real time. <laughs> Vince leaves this little dressing room he's in in his motorized wheelchair. He is going down these hallways as fast as he can. And he gets to the loading gate area. He sees his car. He looks left. He looks right. The coast seems clear. He makes a break for it. He's driving this wheelchair over cables and ramps and shit. And he gets to the limo. And just as the driver is helping him get into the side, Austin comes in from the other side and pushes him back out. Throws him in the street, throws him back in the chair. 
He's verbally, verbally tormenting Austin. Vince is begging for his life. There's people around, by the way. There's dozens of people backstage watching all this not getting involved. Yeah, Steve Austin's got a hunting bow. Bow and arrow. Get the hell out of his way. Mm -hmm. So Austin's pushing this wheelchair. He keeps accidentally banging Vince's bad leg into the walls. And they return to Vince's dressing room and slam the door. And Austin starts grilling Vince about hunting. Yeah. You ever been hunting? Mm -hmm. One time, Vince says, on safari. Yeah. Austin, at that point, he was appalled. Safari is... Ugh, he can't tolerate that. And then Vince said he was only taking pictures. Austin was even more appalled. So he pulls a knife out and asks, do you think this could kill an elephant? To be continued. Rock versus D'Lo Brown. Okay. What shitty music rock? I had? was just going to say, so D'Lo got the nation theme. Yeah. They gave Rock some song. Some pop I dance tune. don't know what it is. It's him saying, do you smell what I'm cooking? And then it's a... Do, 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 the do, do, do. only thing that I can figure is that they, this show aired and like everybody went backstage after the show. And the main topic of conversation was not Vince peeing in his pants, but what the fuck are we going to do about Rock's theme? Well... All right, let's give him the nation theme, and we'll make D'Lo his own theme. So I would bet you anything. I don't know this. This is purely speculation. I would bet next week on this show, D'Lo has his own theme, and Rock has got the nation theme. I'll bet we never hear this song again. I hope not. I don't know how we heard it the first time. This guy's about to be their champion. Yeah. Who okayed that music? Hopefully, Listen, he's fired. Let's make it clear, everyone. This is not a network edit. You can, no. tell, you can tell when they do that. This is the theme Rock had on this episode of Raw, and it's awful. So they're doing this match. I must say, I think the crowd legitimately, they hated D'Lo more than they loved Rocky at this moment. Really hated him. Poor D'Lo out there in the gear that says he's the European champion, even though he's not anymore. And then Rock at the people's elbow, and then I realized, no, no, the crowd likes Rocky more than they hate D'Lo. They love that move. And D'Lo tries something off the ropes. Rock at the rock bottom for the clean win. The first clean finish on the show. Just a nothing match, though. Sure. Of all the matches to get a clean finish, a total nothing rock D'Lo match. And then Henry and D'Lo destroy Rocky afterwards. Austin Dunn shined up his knife. Sharpening his knife. Cuts up some fruit. Well, Pro first he's sitting there. They're both just sitting there. Austin's twiddling with his knife. And then he stands up abruptly and Vince freaks out. And Austin is just getting an apple. Yeah. He says, <laughs> these are his exact words. I'm going to take you tonight. You won't feel a thing. It's pretty threatening. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> then Vince is trying to tell Austin. He's not going to get away with this. Austin goes on a tirade about how bow, bows and arrows work. Tiger Ali scene came out. Oh my god. This is like the worst thing they First ever off, did. what a 90s suit this guy was wearing. One of those weird ass suits with the giant shoulder pads in it. Did have those. Totally oversized suit. Made him look like weird. You know what I mean? Totally not a fitted suit like you'd see nowadays. He's offering $500 to anybody who will come to the ring and swallow one of Babu's long kill bosses. Uh -huh. Sausage. They found a I don't know where, like, would you put an ad in the paper for Busty Sword Swallower? I, well. Because that's what they found. There was a woman who was a regular on the Howard Stern show who called herself the Kilbasa Queen. Is this who this was? I assume this is her. Okay. I don't know for sure. I didn't, I, I well, actually, I mean, she was. She, but she came out, she was clearly a, I mean, midriff showing, cleavage showing, bedazzled everything. Clearly there to, to make an appearance. She right away just grabbed that sausage and swallowed it, popped it back up. Two or three times said, do I do it again now? Like looking at the cameraman and he's saying, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Finally, she does it again. She clearly does this regularly. So then Godfather comes out. Says this woman used to be one of his po one of his hoes. He needs to get paid. And Tiger said, wait a minute. I wanted an amateur, not a professional. Godfather laughed. She's still in the ring. Says, you could have had a whole night with her for a lot less than $500. That's lovely. So they got me a brawl. He's the godfather. I guess so. She's one of his hoes. I guess so. I mean, <laughs> what in the world she, were you she expecting? She did swallow a kibasa twice for, for, for anyway. So they brawled. In storyline, this made perfect sense. <laughs> I guess. if you, I, 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 I suppose it didn't occur to me he might be telling the truth. 
Well, I thought he was working some kind of. Angle. She was standing there, yeah. and he—that's what he claimed. Yeah. So, if in storyline he's telling the truth, then he's telling the truth. I suppose so. Anyway, the geeks separated the brawl. The crowd was chanting for the hoe. This segment was awful, just atrocious. Show was. Austin has shot an arrow into the wall to demonstrate his accuracy and the damage he could do, and then he starts comparing Vince to Ned Beatty in Deliverance, which causes Lawler and Ross to simultaneously say, oh no. Because apparently, not only is he going to murder Vince, now they're convinced he's going to rape him. Gets Vince to squeal like a pig, and Vince starts slowly, and then louder, and the crowd is roaring with this humiliation. So now Austin has moved on. I should have counted how many segments there were about this. Like 15? Yeah. Austin has now moved on to From Deliverance to Misery. He has placed a two by four between Vince's legs. Wants to see if you can hit them with a hammer and actually break them. Vince begins to scream for help. So Austin duct tapes his. He's not sure that'll work. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty confident. I've never tried. <laughs> I don't think it was really an experiment, Brian. Don't move, Vinny. <laughs> he had a stated goal. Now I'm gonna go find a piece of wood. I see. If we were in Craig's house, I'd be concerned. I know there's no uh, carpentry equipment around here. Anyway, Austin duct tapes Vince's mouth shut and goes to get a sledgehammer. Mankind versus Val Venus. I don't know what the fuck was going on here. If one or both of these guys was hurt. I think they were both selling like they were banged up, but like I they, mean, they, they both looked like they were banged up. They started to do a crisscross spot. It was so bad. And they were sad and limping and hobbling around. It was worse than Big Wood versus Avalanche when they did this crisscross spot and it was weird because Foley was in the room with Vince earlier playing Twister I don't know didn't look that banged up then I don't know if because Val was selling the kick to the dick from Goldust because he tried to do his hip swivel and it hurt okay here's what I got out of this forget all this bullshit all you need to know is Terry took the ref Shamrock hit Mankind's knee Val covered him for the pin that is true all right so it's now 2017 and there have been guys over the last 20 years that have just stuck around forever. And as they got older, they only wrestled very infrequently and only against very big names. And Foley was one of them, and Shawn Michaels later, and The Undertaker, and Ric Flair. You know these guys. You see them a couple times a year. They're in a high-profile match. They vanish for a while. It's so weird going back 20 years and seeing Mankind, Mick Foley... The legend, Hall of Famer Mick Foley, just having random matches with Val Venus. It blows my mind every week. Like, Rock. The Rock. Having a random match with just some dude on this show. Well, it's crazy. They weren't legends yet. That's that's what's so weird. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious. I, I understand. But it is funny going back and like, wow, here comes Mick Foley to have a nothing three-minute match with Val Venus. Realize... If we had access to, like, Mid-Atlantic tapes from the mid-70s, we'd see Ric Flair doing jobs for nobody in the middle of the card. I do realize the that. The same thing would happen. But yeah. I, I'm not watching it right now. Yeah. I'm watching this. Yes. Okay. Mankind and Shamrock brawl through the crowd, swinging chairs at each other in the shadows. Then Goldust appears in the big screen, promising Val nothing is over. He's going to shatter his dreams over and over again. Terry chooses this moment to whisper something to Val, and she seems happy. But Val is pissed and leaves her behind. Now, I don't know where this is going. I've forgotten 20 years ago, but I presume that she wants to take this relationship to the next level. And Val, the big Val Boski, ironically, coincidentally, is saying, let me explain something about the dude. <laughs> He's not down with this. I also forget. I assumed that she was telling him she was pregnant. That would do it, too. Yeah, but the fact that she chose this moment. <laughs> I know you've just had a match, and we're still out here in the middle of the ring, but hey, well, by he the way. he was victorious. Was he? I guess he was. Time for a celebration. Uh, I hadn't thought, thought of that. Anyway, we'll see how this goes. Austin could not find a hammer, but he explained he was not there to cause Vince physical pain. Promised again Vince would not feel a damn thing. Austin says, it's time to watch a little TV. They're going to watch the main event. Orders Vince, 
pick someone, pick Kane or The Undertaker. Vince doesn't know what to do. He just chooses Kane. So Austin says, okay, if Kane wins, we will do things the easy way. If anything else happens, we'll do things the hard way. The main event of Monday Night Raw, Kane versus The Undertaker in a casket match, went two minutes tops. They brawled into the casket. They shut the lid with both guys inside. They fought their way free, destroying the casket, and they went to the back, and that was the end. This was a casket match with no finish. Yeah. And no <laughs> contest in a casket match. And you know what's funny, too, is this match sucked, <laughs> and <laughs> it didn't take long to do it either. If you're like a younger fan, if you're under the age of 25, maybe 30, probably 25, you remember like all of these great Undertaker matches, these blow away matches that he had at WrestleMania every year until the very end. Like he had those great matches with Sean, he had those great matches with Triple H. He was like Mr. WrestleMania there for a while. Mm -hmm. What you youngsters don't recall is that in the first 15 years of the undertaker's career he had one fucking horrible match after another <laughs> is it true look at the watch the early undertaker wrestlemania matches he had some bad 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 matches it wasn't until like the early 2000s where suddenly he started having good long pay-per-view matches this match sucked <laughs> and granted he had the great hell in a cell I mean, he did have some great matches. I'm not saying that he wasn't a good worker. I'm just saying that because of his character and the things that they made him do and the cartoonish opponents that he had to beat in cartoonish matches, yes. he had one shitty match after another, year after year after year after year. If we're going to be fair to him, we must say he was having terrible matches with King Kong Bundy, yeah, it wasn't his fault. And Giant Gonzalez. Yeah, these were the guys him, they wanted him to wrestle. Every big stiff they could find. But I mean, how in the world can you have a four-minute casket match with no finish and have it be any good? They're fucking both in the casket trying to break their way out, and they can't break the casket. There's a point where you can hear, I don't know what happened, but you can hear Lee Clear Taker asking Kane if he's okay. Yep, you can hear Lee Clear that. That's right. Anyway, Austin says, well, Vince, you lost. So he wheels him out to the arena. This was also shot in real time. I went back and timed it. From the moment he wheeled Vince out of the dressing room to the moment they came out on stage, three minutes of dead air. Ross and Lawler working overtime, trying, trying to find something to say. This was a long overrun show. Apparently. Yeah. This was within a half hour of the length of Nitro, which is a three-hour show. Yeah. So finally Austin comes out. He's got Vince in a wheelchair, pushes him down to the ring, orders him to crawl into the ring, and he grabs a mic. He says, I missed the party that opened this show. Please show the party from earlier on, this uh, earlier on the show that opened the show. And Vince is just in the ring, kneeling and weeping as this is going on. Austin pulls out a letter and says, Vince, here's a letter for you to read. It will make you cry even more, and it will piss off the devil once you meet him. He put it in Vince's pocket, and we never found out what was on that letter, at least not on this show. Now, did Vince read it, or did he not read it yet? Not, that, not yet. Okay. He ordered Vince to look up the screen, where there was a live shot of himself. And then he says, it's time, or whatever. And he pulls out the pistol, points it in the air, sticks it in the back of Vince's neck, in fact. So he's going to make Vince's eyes pop out, and he wants Vince to watch it. And then he pulls the trigger of the gun, and a flag comes out. It says, bang, 316. Even in the 90s, when he was sitting there waving that gun around, and he had Vince on his knees. I mean, the crowd was not cheering for him to kill Vince McMahon. <laughs> they were a little bit like, what the fuck's going on right here? But when the bang came out of the gun, the little flag, they did go nuts. Yes. They breathed again. Like, I think there may have been people in the building who thought, he's gonna shoot Vince McMahon here on live TV. So... Vince has pissed himself. His pants leg is all wet. Austin brings him to, brings him to his feet, says, McMahon 316 means I just pissed my pants. He gives Vince a stunner. He celebrates for a while. Gives Vince another stunner. And then the regular show ends. But as you noted, this is a very, very long show. And it's time for extra attitude. 
That was funny, by the way, about Vince pissing his pants. The high technology they used. I don't know for sure, but when he was selling at the end, you could see the outline uh -huh. on his pants. I think they just gave him a fucking squirt gun. It may be. <laughs> like, that's the best they could come up with. And to make this look good. Here, put this damn squirt gun in your pocket. So, Austin leaves. Vince is down on his belly, pants soiled, everyone's cheering, and he's just sobbing. Like a minute goes by, and then the students arrive in the nick of time. <laughs> they put him in the chair, they're wheeling him away, pushing the chair at the ramp. He's openly sobbing, fans are throwing trash at him. This is all so great. Now... Do you know that Vince McMahon was willing to humiliate himself for the benefit of his performers? <laughs> On a regular basis. <laughs> this is the key. It wasn't a once a year thing. It was week in and week out. Dude, I've talked about this a thousand times. Yeah. It was five times in one show. Yes. Over and over and over again. I don't know if anybody in the history of pro wrestling ever sold for anybody as much as Vince sold for Steve Austin. That's a fair question. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I don't know if anyone ever, ever in wrestling sold for anybody more than Vince sold for Steve Austin. Find somebody for him. Certainly nobody more effectively. I got, that's for sure. That is for sure. So, before we get into Nitro, when Nitro was done, I thought this was a bad show, and I recapped all the finishes. And I was thinking about it. I said, you know what? There were some bad finishes on Raw, too. So to be fair, I should recap the finishes on this show as well. The finishes on this show. A pinfall that should have been a DQ. A pin after distraction by his own teammate. A run in DQ. One clean pin. A pin after interference. And a no contest in a casket match. That done about covers it. What shit? So then. Retro Raw number 283. October 26th, 1998. Let me tell you something about this show. Going back 19 years. That I've learned. The storytelling has always sucked. <laughs> this is not a new thing. Am I wrong? No. We got the final chapter of a 20-part story on the show, and we did not get chapters 1 through 19. It's not even that, but we'll get into it during the show. But there's so much stuff on the show that just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And the place just goes crazy for it. Right. So they didn't learn any lessons. No. Why, why should they? Just kept doing it. They were making money hand over fist. It began with Steve Austin arriving at the building earlier today, all smiles. And then in the building, Vince McMahon and his crew came out with plentiful legal representation. Vince was so pissed. He says he held Austin responsible for everything terrible that had happened to him. He blamed the fans too. My God, what's the matter with you people? I've lost all faith in humanity. His voice is cracking. Then he growled as he asked what happened to their values and morals. So the fans had cheered Austin as Austin had made him beg, made him cry, made him urinate himself. On the verge of tears, recapping all this humiliation. Then it occurred to him, nobody had come to his aid, and he started barking at his cronies. He said the letter Austin had jammed into his pocket was a legal document, but he and his attorneys were ready to fight Austin to the Supreme Court. Then Austin appeared on the big screen, said Vince was a big baby, needed a diaper. And Vince was outraged, ordered himself wheeled away. I know it's an evergreen statement, but Vince was outstanding here. He's always outstanding. He's the best. There were so many signs about Vince peeing his pants this week. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. So after the break, Vince orders his attorneys and their comb-overs to find a way to break Austin's document. X-Pac versus Steve Blackman for the prestigious European title. Hit a good match for about four minutes, and then Steve Regal ran out and attacked X-Pac for the DQ. Not quite. William Regal, or Steve Regal, or whatever he was this week, he runs down and he starts beating the shit out of X-Pac outside the ring. He's punching him, he's kicking him, he's beating his ass. The ref runs out there and he's trying to pull the guy off. It wasn't until DX ran down and a brawl broke out that the referee finally signaled for the bell. I don't know, maybe he was too busy earlier, but it sure seemed to me like he was going to let this go until too many men got involved. Hmm. The announcers made mention that China had taken a leave of absence. A leave of absence? Until her, until her, until her issues with Mark Henry are cleared up. Legal issues. Clearly not a leave of absence. I'm sure it was just 
a series of days off. Typical it, stupid raw finish. Yes. Including, by the way, Steve Blackman didn't care about any of this being screwed out of his title shot. That's right. I mean, I know maybe it's... A, it'll, maybe it'll play off next week. We'll see. I know it's only the prestigious European title, but still. Vince was screaming at his attorneys, you wrote it, find a way to break it. Graz versus Rock. You know how many times I'm sure Vince McMahon screamed that at his attorneys? <laughs> Including numerous times during that World Wildlife Fund lawsuit. You wrote it, find a way to break it. Well, they couldn't. No. Before you start, Vinny. Yes? Draws came out in full LOD face paint and shoulder pads. Yes. Can you imagine if somebody got this rub in the 80s from the Road Warriors? It would have been a bigger deal. Absolutely. A third Road Warrior and, yeah. Nobody cared here. Well, no. Let me tell you what I noticed. <sighs> yeah. It took exactly one week, as we predicted, for them to fix Rock's fucking music. That's true. They didn't have that stupid song. And we said that last week. We did, yes. I said, I guarantee next week he's not going to have that stupid music. Sure enough, he got his old music back. Yes. Like the 19th remix of the <laughs> Nation of Domination theme. Amazing. So what I got out of this is that, boy, Draws was really bad in this match. He was horrible. He, it's not just this match. Well, he was worse than usual. Well, he's he's okay if you put him in a tag match where there's three other guys to carry the load. Sure. A singles match... This was very ugly. This was an ugly, ugly match. And he looked like a robot. Looked like a robot. Looked like a big, robotic, jacked-up robot. Did he jumping back elbow off the ropes, landed right on Rock's mouth. Can you tell how pissed Rock was? I don't blame him. And then, maybe because Draws was so bad in this match, Rock just beat him up for a while, hit the rock bottom, people's elbow, pinned him. Well, you missed the key spot before his comeback. Draws climbs up to the middle rope, He's going to do a giant diving shoulder tackle with <laughs> his right. football background. And he flies through the air and Rock just steps out of the way. And draws fucking crashes like the world's biggest geek. And then Rock did hit the people's elbow. and Huge pop for the finish. Still not facing a hard cam. No, he faces no. the ramp for some reason. So they have to use a camera on the floor to film it. You gotta watch your back. Place one nuts. And that was the match. Hawk and Draws got into a shoving match, and Animal and Draws left together with Hawk alone in the ring. Oh, mm, man. Mm. He hasn't that... fallen off the Titan Tron yet, has he? No. I believe the fall of the Titan Tron is the last time we see him on Raw. Mm, man. I'm not sure. I'm not... There are so many things that I think <laughs> are the last time I saw somebody yeah. on Raw, and they just keep coming back. Yeah, that is true. Michael Cole tried to interview Austin. Austin briefly checked with what we were, would assume is his attorney. He leaned into the into the room and talk to somebody and said I've been advised not to speak yet but I will have a statement later that was Shane McMahon dude in front of the oh, people oh yeah that too he said the New Age Outlaws and X-Pac would be performing with Motley Crue <laughs> well what they were right <laughs> technically <laughs> that is what happened talk about bizarre <laughs> McMahon's lawyers left the office shaking their heads saying he just doesn't get it <laughs> he just doesn't understand. He just doesn't get it. I bet this also happened a dozen I'm times. I'm sure it has a million times. So DX was hanging out with Motley Crue backstage. Then the Outlaws did their entrance, introduced Motley Crue, and went backstage. And I thought this would actually be what counts as performing with them. No, no. So Crue comes out to do Wild Side, a song that was 11 years old by this point. Should have done Livewire on Livewire. Oh, good call. Yeah. Uh, Vince Neil had a shirt that said Fucker on it. So they put black tape over we the We think. It could have been a Meet the Fockers shirt, and they just put a big... That, that wasn't out yet, Brian. Just go with it. This was not edited well. His shirt. Are we sure that it wasn't like the Steve Austin shirt that said, Fock Fear? So maybe like a picture, Remember that one? A print, they printed a picture of tape where the you should be. Uh, yeah. Stranger, stranger things have happened. So they're doing this song. Feck, fack. Could have been anything. Could have been... Could have been... I don't know. I actually do. I, I did get a uh, refrigerator magnet from my sister-in-law that says feck. <laughs> See? Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was a refrigerator shirt. Did you say refrigerator? Magnet. Magnet. <laughs> well, a magnet goes on in a refrigerator. Refrigerator shirt. For that refrigerator that needs a little well, more insulation. What the hell is feck then? It's a refrigerator. It's a magnet, right? Yes. It's a that goes on a refrigerator. Yeah, so sure. it's a logo for something. What's feck? Feck is an uh, Irish slang for fuck. Well, maybe he was in Ireland. There you go. Grabbed himself that shirt. Hmm. 
Regardless, they're doing this song, and then out come the Outlaws and X-Pac, and they're cross-chopping and dancing. And Road Dog and X-Pac, X-Pac have the hair and the energy to pull this off, and there's Billy just trying his best to play air guitar. Dude. It's one of those things where I'm sure, like, in the moment, in 1998, when they were super over, it was like, man, look at how awesome this is. No. Looking at it today, like, look at these geeks. The guy that I don't try to stand next to at concerts is a guy that is playing air guitar by himself. Yeah. Really, anywhere in life, that's probably a good rule. Billy Gunn and I the mall, can the never golf course. hang out. You don't say. No. <laughs> I don't see you and Billy Gunn having a lot in common. Well, he did ask to see my backside. That's right. true. He didn't want you to moon him. Anyway, they sang. There was some pyro. And then a fan appeared on the ramp, and a bodyguard picked mm -hmm. him up and carried him away. And that would be a test in his Raw debut. Now, they said they did this on Livewires, or excuse me, on Saturday Night Heat as well. Yeah. Probably the exact Sunday same Night. song, exact same spot. So what's up with Test? Like, he was a legit roadie. Sure. Was he a legit roadie here, and he later became a wrestler? I don't think so. Or I... was he a wrestler, and he just went back to his roadie ways for his debut? I'm pretty sure they had him signed and trained and ready to go, and to debut him, they pretended he was Motley Crue's bodyguard. Mm -hmm. yeah. My memories of Tester, lean, with a few exceptions. This is all to plug, by the way, Motley Crue's Greatest Hits album. So at least that explains why they did an 11-year-old song. Their first Greatest Hits album. Their first Greatest Hits album. <laughs> yeah. Vince was outraged at his attorneys for not getting their jobs done. Kane versus Gangrel. Oh, my Lord almighty. I'm watching Raw in 2017, and Kane's out there squashing Finn Balor. Yeah. I go back 19 years, Kane comes out, he's squashing Gangrel. Vampires, demons. It is absolutely amazing. Like, Kane's still out there. Oh, yeah. Now, granted, he's got a full bodysuit and a mask and a wig. Oh, yeah. But he looks exactly the same. Like, nothing has changed. He moves the same, same physique. It's mind blowing. That wig has got to go. And let me tell you something about this Gangrel. Like, we're not watching the pay per views and we're not watching any of these other shows. We only watch Raw. This fucking guy is just like a geek. He loses a lot. <laughs> he's been around for what, two months now? Mm -hmm. And we've seen him come out, spit a little b bit of blood, and now he's just a jobber. I think with he, his with his cronies. I think he won one time on Raw and then has just lost and gotten beat up since then. Yeah. Take this match, for example, where Kane beat him and beat him and beat him. Christian interfered, Kane beat him and beat him and beat him, and then Kane pinned Gangrel with a choke slam. Complete squash. It was very similar to that Finn Balor match, now that I really think about it. They Except did, there was only th one choke slam here instead of three. They did mention... I think they said Kane, Kane's the first guy, but he is in the 16-man tournament at Survivor Series. Earlier, they did mention Rocks in there. I see. So... While also mentioning that he's the number one contender. I, <laughs> Shouldn't he just get the title? <laughs> or, at least, or at least go to the finals. Something. Yeah. So... Uh, Christian and Gangrel jump Kane, and they're beating him up for a while. He starts to make a comeback, and then Edge appears and chops block, chop blocks him. So now there's three vampires. Turning heel. Inexplicably. Unless he was a heel. I don't even remember. He was feuding with Gangrel and Christian. Okay. Yeah, did I miss a whole bunch of storylines? Yeah. We yeah. missed a lot only watching Raw. No. <laughs> Nowadays, you miss nothing if you only watch Raw. But back then... Mm -hmm. I don't think this was ever... I, I was watching every show... And the and uh, the vampires are my buddy Jim's favorites, so I knew all about what was going on with them. Well, it just goes to show you that blood is thicker than water. Oh, hey, there you go. And all vampire jokes suck. Any more? No, I'm good. Okay. Anyway, there's three guys there. Kane still did the zombie zombie sit up and chase them away. What an impotent group of geeks! We're <laughs> not doing very well. No. Steve Austin came out for a promo. If you told me this entrance right here was the absolute peak of Austin Mania, I would believe you. I would believe you. Well, let me tell you something. It's not. No, but it, the reaction was insane. So Austin explained. He outright told the cops his gun was a toy, and it was. He said Vince wouldn't feel any pain, and Vince didn't. So he was telling the truth the whole time. Then he revealed he had a new contract with the WWF, and the contract included one title shot. Out came Vince with the attorneys. He says, we can't do anything about your legal document, but I am going to find a way to make you quit. Very casually confirmed, Austin had been rehired. This is news to Ross. 
So first Vince, Vince's uh, first plan to get Austin to quit was to book him in an I quit match against Ken Shamrock. Then he began to tear up. How could you do what you did to get that contract? What you've done is turn a relatively incompetent, underachieving kid into a monster. So out comes Shane McMahon. And Vince calls him to the stage, but Shane goes to the ring. And this is what I was, what I was referring to earlier when I said we got chapter 20 of a 20 chapter story right here. <sighs> this goddamn thing went on forever. <laughs> Shane's out there. He's practically weeping. He's begging for his father's before attention. Before you even get that, our exposure to Shane, was, there was like one time he tried to talk Vince out of fighting. Other than that, he's been a spastic commentator <laughs> who really loved pops. Yeah. yeah. There was never a hint of bitterness no. or jealousy no. or resentment. Well, he explained it a little bit in this promo, kind of. He did say he had been lying. Well, he said that, and he also said that with Vince, it's all about... What was the word he used? It's all about the, uh, you know, Business. putting on airs. I see. It's all about... Well, what the hell word did he use? Yeah. God damn it, I didn't write it down. His dad His dad said it's all about creating, a, creating an illusion, or something like that. Or it's about... You know what I mean? Help me out here. It's about... You know... You know what I mean, Vince? Why, why don't I read my notes here? We'll see if it comes up. I don't think it's gonna. You'll so, surely fuck it up. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so Shane explains he's an officer and a stockholder with the company, and what Vince had done was wrong. It's not wrong. that. He said he was the one who had hired Austin back. Uh, After 28 years, he finally had Vince's attention. Mm -mm. He had been lying about the relationship to protect the family name for 28 years, but mm -mm. he's done. Mm -mm. His grades, his athletics, his business money, never enough for Vince. Mm -mm. All he wanted was for Daddy to be proud of him. Image. Image. That's the word you're Vince looking for. always talked to him about the image that you put out there. Mm. Image. You know what I mean? I can confirm I did not write that word That's down. That's what I thought. Mm. I knew it. But I heard it. So the point is, like, he's been out there acting like he's the happy son of Vince McMahon all this time. But in reality, there's been nothing but strife. And there's been a lot that he's been holding up inside him for all these years. He's been trying, like on commentary. You think he went backstage and Vince said, Hey, son, great job on commentary, kid. Never. Not one time. He's been trying and trying. He's putting over his pops and his family. I'm doing a much better job than Shane did. Yeah. He was so whiny and so <laughs> unlikable. Nobody's cheering. No. And he does his whole spiel. And he gets done and... It's just dead silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's an awkward silence. And then Steve Austin, what did he say? If you think Vince deserves... Or no, he goes, if you think Vince got what he deserves, give me a hell yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the way Steve said it, this was the best thing on the whole show. It's so awkward that Steve Austin says it in a way where he's a little bit embarrassed and he's just kind of trying to break the ice a little bit. <laughs> You're like, not wrong. It's just so quiet in the building. He's kind of like, well, if you think Vince got what he deserved, give me a hell yeah. They all go, yeah. And I'm like, this is such a strikeout. It, it it's fail. such a strikeout. <laughs> yeah. Fans uh, did not know what to make of this non-Austin stuff and uh, they were quiet until Austin told them to cheer. You go to break, when they come back, Shane is leaving. Austin tosses him a beer. You know what is funny about this whole Shane McMahon thing? What is ironic about it? This storyline is that Vince never cared about his son, and he never did anything for him. He never gave him any attention. It was always about Vince. This whole goddamn storyline is about getting Shane over. This whole storyline was last year's WrestleMania. This whole storyline... Like, Austin's got to endorse the guy. Who has Austin ever thrown a beer to? Austin hates everybody, but he respects young Shane. Remember who bought WCW? Shane McMahon. They tried over and over with Shane. It just never worked. And this was the first time it really didn't work. Tiger Ali Singh versus The Godfather. This guy sucks. If you're Listen, wondering why it took them another two decades to try an Indian superstar... Tiger Ali screwed it up for the entire country. But do you know what's funny about this? No. I'm not going to pretend this was a good match. Thank you. This completely sucked, okay? It was horrible. 
but I'm not sure that Jinder Mahal is better than Tiger Ali. Oh, Singh. come on now. Dude. No, dude. You, that's not on, fair. No. That's May I start fair. watching these shows, Vinny? You don't even get a vote. You're not even watching the show. <laughs> I watched them I live. watch them. Yeah, one match. Who did hey, he wrestle? He didn't pro- wrestle. Yeah, bad example. He didn't wrestle, bad you example. idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen... He's been... He's not new. He's so clunky and mechanical. Jinder Mahal's been around for three or four years. At best... He's been around for over a decade. <laughs> you, okay, I've... Point is, I've seen him a lot. I wrote, Jinder Mahal at his worst was a hundred times better than Tiger Ali Oh, Singh. man. No. So Tiger comes out. If anything, they're equal. No. <laughs> that you're factually wrong. No, I'm talking in the ring. I'm not talking like their promos and everything. Jinder is way better. He's got way better presence, and he's got way better promos than Tiger Ali Singh. But mechanically in the ring, they aren't that far off. Craig, your opinion? Brian, you're wrong. <laughs> no. Okay. You are so wrong. You numbskulls. Did any Get of you catch, of by the way? The announcers were talking over it, so it was hard to it's hard to hear, but I went back to check, and it's true. Tiger Ali Singh's hometown in this match? The continent of Asia. Oh, wow. It's a big house. They narrowed it down to 17 million square miles. Sure. Well, he's rich. Oh, they're having this... Just horrendous See, the problem brawl. is this match was terrible. It was an it's awful Godfather match. It's Godfather versus Tiger Ali Singh. Just so bad. It sucked. Then they did my new worst finish of all time. Apparently happened on SmackDown again tonight, because whenever it happens, I hear about it. Somebody gets disqualified for kicking too much ass. <laughs> this time, as they have spent several minutes boring the crowd, which is now doing the wave to amuse themselves, and then both men are disqualified for kicking too much ass. Yeah, that's what happened. They got into a brawl. I turned on this show to see you guys fight. And then when guys got in a fight, they got disqualified for fighting. Yeah. This was death TV. Like, not gonna lie. I, I, I had so strongly mixed reactions because I was so happy the match was over. But so angry because of why. I was just happy the match was over. Worst match on Raw 98, I wrote. Well, I don't know about that. Does that count Brawl for All? Oh, most Brawl for Alls are way better than this. What do you mean, both? We lost like most. 15 matches. Most, I said. Maybe well, I said. that means there are some that were worse. May have said both. Michael Cole asked Vince, how do you feel? He was devastated. Vince just asked him to repeat the question and left. In a match I am not making up, Kai and Tai versus Kurgan and Golga and the Insane Clown Posse. Yes. <laughs> I was fixing to be so mad in this match, but then what I was so mad about, it made sense in the end. Because the oddities come out, and the place just goes crazy for them. They're dancing, they're singing, they love them. ICP tags in, the place is just going crazy. ICP proceeds to cheat. They're like Jimmy Valiant. Every move they do is cheating. Yes. I'm like, why are you fuckers cheating? Like, you're the baby faces, they're right? They're insane and they're clowns. Well, turns out they cheated, and they cheated, and they cheated, and then they threw down the ref, and they were DQ'd, and the oddities were mad at them for screwing up the match. Yes. Now, I don't know why, I don't know what the fuck's going on, but at least at the end of the day, the story worked. <laughs> they were cheating, they got DQ'd, and the baby faces got mad at them. They are insane clowns. I believe Violent J was the best worker on his team. Mm-hmm. For sure. Well, one of know. the better workers on the show. In I fact, mean, the past two matches, what Kai and Tai? Golga is a good worker, but he's forced to be Golga, Golga here. Yeah. This is not the Kai and Tai that was on Barely Legal. No, okay. but it, I'm still, uh, I, I believe... Well, it is. It is, but it isn't. No. They're still better than Violent J. I like, I like Violent J. He's not as good a wrestler as Taka Michinoku. Debate? No. Okay. Anyway, yes. The clowns tagged in, cheated a lot, got intentionally DQ'd. This made the freaks mad, so the clowns left. I don't know if they were intentionally DQ. They just got really mad at the ref. They threw him down. So you think they were surprised when the ref disqualified them for throwing him I down? I think, yes, it's possible. I'm sticking with my theory of they got themselves disqualified. Well, they, usually you, you, when you get intentionally disqualified, it's because the heel's getting his ass kicked, and so he gets disqualified to save himself or something. You're right. These clowns were kicking ass, yes. and they just threw that ref down because he was in the way. The ref was, was in the way of their fun. Did yeah. they protest the disqualification? They didn't give a shit. They celebrated like they won. Again. Because they're insane clowns. Because he did it on purpose. Craig's right here. They replay it like the entire Shane promo. 
because they thought it was good. <laughs> Vince is being wheeled out of the building. The Stooge has promised Mr. MacMan he will take care of Austin and he'll quit before the night is over. And as he's giving in the limo and their window's rolling up, I'm not sure who it is, but one of them just says, Bye, Vince! <laughs> Pretty sure that would have been Briscoe. Although he would have said Mr. McMahon, so now I don't know. Mm -hmm. Cole interviewed Shamrock. I think Patterson always calls him Vince. I think it was probably Pat, yeah. Shamrock promised Austin he would... Or, excuse me. Shamrock Proston? <laughs> Sham... Sham Jesus Christ. <laughs> Shamrock... You promised to, to Austin, there we go, that he would make him say I quit. Because <laughs> he didn't watch Ron after recap Paul Heyman's tongue twister. <laughs> Shamrock also told Austin to knuckle up. The brand that brags Brock. Ooh. Three times fast. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Not a chance. He didn't fuck it up one time. It's He's impressive. Paul Heyman. Yeah. I'm Vinny V. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That discussion's over. Ratings through the roof. We should add. <laughs> would be through the roof if Paul Heyman was on this show. Probably. Yeah. I think you're right. Shamrock said, let's knuckle up. Yeah. But they do not have to put their hair up. Thank no. God. No. <laughs> Neither of them. Did either of you catch, by the way, Hulk Hogan on Twitter saying, I think it's time to go with that stone cold haircut? No, it was time 10 years ago. 30 years ago. <laughs> He's finally going to shave his head. <laughs> That's what he said. What in the hell took so goddamn long? He finally long? realized, you know what? I think I'm going bald. Can you, <laughs> what in the fuck took you, so goddamn long? Can you imagine Hogan coming to Locks of Love and, and dropping off the skull? At, Sir, this isn't... Okay, we'll just take it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Belaya. Mark Merrill versus Goldust. He probably sat down in that barber chair one day and... <laughs> They went to just bleach that fucking ugly haircut again. He's like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> They're probably right. I'm in my mid-60s. This is fucking stupid. <laughs> what a waste of my time. Mark Miro versus Goldust. Goldust sets up Miro for the Shattered Dreams kick. Jacqueline slaps him. Not a DQ. Goldust kisses her. Not a DQ. Goldust kicks Miro in the balls. This is a DQ. Intentional disqualification in back-to-back -back matches. It's one of those things where I'm watching the show and of all the times for Whitney to walk into the room, <laughs> it's right there where Goldust has just kissed Jackie, then he grabs his junk, then he kicks a dude in the balls, and then Sable's huge tits come out. <laughs> She's like, what are you watching? I was like, this is my job. <laughs> <sighs> so... As Brian noted, Sable's huge tits did That's appear. That's all true. Yeah. I'm not making anything up here. <laughs> Everything he said was accurate. <laughs> uh, Sable's huge tits challenged Jacqueline to a match at Survivor Series and promised there would be a new women's champ. There's two women. I was happy that they didn't all take their clothes off for once. There's two women in this division. Yes. Two. Yes. Teasing the arrival of a third. Cole interviewed Mankind and Al Snow. And they argued about what was stupider, Mr. Sacco or Head. And the answer is Head. Yeah. Not even close. Then we had the New Age Outlaws versus Mankind and Al Snow. Mankind also in the Survivor Series tournament. Mankind also coming out before Al Snow. The big star of the match. I guess. Billy Gunn pressed Al over his head. And it was so easy that while he had him up there, he said, I'm going to dance a jig. Yeah, he was on one leg at one point. <laughs> he, he was pretty excited about that Motley Crue concert. I guess so. I also like when he says, wham, every time he throws a punch. So he had a road dog a bit, including Mankind trying to dance like him. Failing. He's going for Socko. Everyone cheers. Billy puts a stop to that. Everyone boos. Ref tells Billy to get out of the ring. Billy says, he was going for Socko. Then Al and Mankind fought over who would get to use head, and then neither one did. No. Who would get to use whose stupid gimmick? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, all right. A four-way breaks out. Al has Rhodey pinned with the Northern Lights bomb, but there's no ref. So Al goes for head, but then Mankind wanted to use Sako, and then Rhodey pinned Al with the schoolboy. Talk about a geek of the week. You fucking idiots arguing over who's going to use a stupid gimmick, and one guy gets rolled up and pinned by a guy they had beat. 
show is so hard to watch. <laughs> well, on that note, out came D'Lo and Mark Henry to brawl with the outlaws. I have lost all track of who is feuding with who on the mid-card of the show. I could have sworn the headbangers were top contenders. The headbangers? Didn't, because they broke the radio over Overdogs like two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. Dude, there's been like 25 shows since then. There's been two shows since then. Yeah, there's been like Heat, Raw... I'm sure it, a pay-per-view It would be nice there. for some acknowledgement if they had a tag Hell team Hell no, the they don't tell you jack shit on this show. You kidding me? That's for Nitro. I never know what's going on. Yeah. Nitro should start replaying Raw angles while they're at it. <laughs> Steve, I will put over Al Snow for one thing. Okay. He hit a great snow plow. Yeah. It looked awesome. Which part of it was, you know, the road dog going absolutely straight as a board vertical down on his head. But it looked cool. We had Shamrock versus Austin in an I Quit match. What an utter load of bullshit. Mm -hmm. This is what I was talking about earlier. This didn't make a goddamn lick of sense, but the fans just went crazy for the finish. And it was so stupid. This is not, everybody, a submission match. No. It's an I Quit match. That means that somebody has to say the words, I quit. Into a microphone. Yeah. Was there a microphone around, by the way? No, I don't remember no. seeing it anywhere. No, no, no. By the way, at the very beginning, were they piping in Austin chants to sound like the Goldberg chants? Or am I crazy? I think you're nuts. Mm -hmm. I might be nuts. Maybe they piped in Goldberg chants. <laughs> Maybe. So, if you ignore how much no sense this made, as a brawl was pretty fun. Let's see. The Stooges tried to trip Austin, attack the ref, took him out. Mankind runs out, puts Shamrock in the mandible claw, and Austin adds a chair shot to the head for good measure. And then Austin puts Shamrock basically in a crossface, and as the ref is checking Shamrock, Austin lifts Shamrock's arm up and down to simulate tapping. And the ref deems this a guy saying, I quit, and ends the match. I was just like, that's what you came up with? <laughs> that's what you came up with? It was so stupid. Now granted, I mean... They weren't going to make anybody say I quit. And I know that Vince just wanted to sign an I quit match because he wants Austin to quit. But God, what a fucking stupid payoff this was. But the fans didn't care one bit. They rang. They, as they say, they raised Austin's hand. And man, they loved that. So uh, I started this last week and I'm going to keep, keep it up as long as I can remember. But the finish is on this show. DQ did interference by Englishman. Clean pin, clean pin. That's pretty good, actually. That's that's two more than I expected. Double DQ, intentional DQ, another intentional DQ, pinfall where two partners fight over who gets to use the goofy weapon, and I quit where nobody says I quit. Yeah, that's right. That's pretty awful. It's horrible. <laughs> Should mention afterwards, Austin gave all three of the Stooges stunners, and somebody had tweeted, and they had claimed... That Gerald Briscoe took a worse stunner than Vince McMahon. I said I'd have to see it to believe it. I can now tell you, having seen it, that man's wrong. Yeah, I watched this days ago, and I made no note of... Oh, no, it wasn't a bad... I mean, it was just like he, he took the stunner and kind of did a f shoulder roll out of it. Hmm. But this was not Vince, where Vince cannot get the timing on a goddamn stunner right. I have no idea how. Fucks it up every time. I've, I've yet to see someone take it worse than Vince. There was that time, I think it was right after Austin turned babyface again after the invasion, but he's giving stunners like 20 guys, and he's so excited he's going too fast for them, and he starts using the force, and he stuns him. He does a stunner to nobody, and a guy three feet behind him takes a bump. <laughs> That's probably pretty bad. That's some PWG stuff right there. One of my there. favorite stunners of all time was in 2001. For those of you people who think I have a terrible memory, I could be wrong here, but... <laughs> It was the show. I'm pretty sure it was December of 2001. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. It was the it was the tournament to determine the undisputed champion. Yes. And it was Steve Austin versus Kurt Angle. Correct. And Steve Austin kicks him in the cut and he gives him a stunner and Kurt Angle stands straight up and down and falls like a tree to his back. Yes. It was so awesome. It was the best. Well, that was raw. 